You wouldn't know it to look at them, you know. Courtney is very laid back. Mar was put together, but for a, somebody that lives in the city, I mean, Courtney is just, you know, she's an environmental girl. Jeans, yeah, yeah. You know, long hair, just whatever it looks like. <laughs> and, uh, but she, like I said, she is really smart. And she, I, they work so hard. How do you, are you farming? Not yet. I'm on, I'm this coming year. Um, I missed, you have to be with the company two years. I was one week short of two years when they did all of the, Whoa. so I have to wait till next year, but I'm on the list. For, for how long you were with environmental services? Thir almost 14 years. 13. 13 full weeks. Let me put, let me put this from there so you can see. Oh, my butt is so sore from sitting. <laughs> You were there for 13 or 14 years. Yeah, yeah, wow. over third, just under 14. So I just call it 13, but it was close to 14 years. And I would have stayed, but the owner just kept putting ownership options on the table and then he'd take them away. Well, where's my future? Good. No problem. I'll see you there. Hey, Bye -bye. How are you? Doing everything all right? Hey, Mike. Hey, hey Rafa. How are you doing, sir? Fine. Good, Good to see you, man. You met uh, I'm Shannon. Shannon? Yes, uh, kind I guess uh, we're, we're here, here. Yeah, yeah. we'll formally introduce ourselves, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Oh, no problem, I'm going to bore you to death, but he told me it was an hour and 45 minutes, I'm like, what? Yeah, pretty much, but hey. That is long. We got to go through it, you know? <laughs> that is long. <laughs> Very long. I've done some Ford Realtor presentations, and they're like 35, 45 minutes max, you know? Yeah. But, yeah after that, attention span starts kind of... Yeah, and especially this voice for that long. <laughs> Everybody will be sleeping. We'll be good. We'll soak it all in. <laughs> it's a lot, too. He wanted me to cover a lot. Yeah. So. You want me to tell you, like, I wasn't going to go up until the last minute. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to call whoever appointment I have. I'm just going to yeah, tell so them. Yeah, yeah. sometimes, because we never stopped. We were hired as hell. We never 30, saw. But we were so grateful that we spent that time together because it, it was That's awesome. months and months that we haven't. I was you know? jealous. I saw your pictures outside. I'm jealous. <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes you have to do that. I know. Because and I felt good. I didn't even good. regret it. Good. Regret. Good, good, good. So, so is that is that your pet? That is not my pet. Can you tell <laughs> I was a lot younger in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, that was, um, or that was that a domesticated raccoon? <laughs> no, actually he was, that's a baby raccoon. Okay. So his mama got hit by a car. Oh. So, so, I'm not going to go into this story during yeah. the presentation, so I'll tell you now. So basically there was a barrel, we put in a fenced in area, there was a barrel up here and then a small kid's swimming pool. So we basically had to teach him how to nest and how to find food. So instead of feeding him by hand, we would put the food in the water, like so eggs, it cover it up with moss, so we'd have to find the egg to eat it, yes. Look at that. But so they get cute. aggressive. This was a male, and he, they get aggressive. So once he started to get aggressive, then you let him into the wild, and you know he's good to go. Yeah. But when they nice. But at that point, he was just... You're teaching him how to be a raccoon? <laughs> yeah, but I'd walk into the cage, and he'd just crawl right up my leg. Right up. That's neat. It's just you, one of my. You don't see that, really. Yeah, it's just one of my favorite pictures, and it's the one I use to say, "Look how, look when I started getting into this silliness." That's nice. How long ago was that? Okay, twenty. What? Twenty what? Probably twenty-five years ago. That picture. No, for yeah, you. Yeah, maybe twenty. You're good, girl. Yeah. <laughs> you look good. I've been doing this a long time. Wow, so, that is a good memory. That's from way back. Yeah, that was actually, I lived in Fort Myers at the time. Oh, did you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. So that was, uh, there was, uh, my next door neighbor had a panther sanctuary. Oh, wow. And so that's where. Look at that. Yeah, when well, that happened. Into I just, the exotics, huh? Yeah. He, was, yeah, he had a tiger. I have another picture with my face right next to a tiger's head that's like this giant. No way, that's, that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. That's nice. That was fun. I used to do a lot of write a lot of articles for his website. Oh, oh did you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, help him out. Yeah, yeah, exposure and stuff like that. Yeah. Nice. So he was start you know starting a nonprofit. And that's a lot of work. But he had more cats than anything else. That's pretty good. Cool. Yeah, I had red fox. He had a lot of neat animals there. Nice. But the panthers, 
you know, that get displaced and stuff, or that couldn't, you know, got hurt and then couldn't go back into the wild. He yeah, the old Kiwi like sanctuary for them. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So it was cool. It was great. So definitely a uh, uh, animal lover for sure. Oh yeah, but I couldn't be a vet because I can't stand blood, and I couldn't put an animal. I mean, I can't <laughs> put an, my own animals down, but I have a house full. <laughs> I don't know. That's already hard as it is with your own. You don't want yeah. to see it all the time. Yeah. No, I couldn't. <laughs> That's what my parents were like. You're going to be a veterinarian. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> a lot of my passion, though, comes from my grandfather. My grandfather was, he could do like a hundred bird calls with whistling. Uh -uh. Oh, yeah. On his own. Oh, yeah. He was just, and he always took me when we would go to do things together, would always be outdoors, you know. That's pretty neat, yeah. yeah. Riding rafts down a river or... Go hunting and stuff like that? I no. didn't hunt, but I can't kill things. Same thing. <laughs> Cockroaches, I can kill them pretty easy. Yeah. But I don't even kill spiders. My husband's like, kill that thing. I'm like, no, put it outside. <laughs> the biggest worst with cockroaches, actually. I don't, I kill them. Then he gets, my husband gets mad. Don't kill my friends. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want your friends in our house. <laughs> we only have them in the garage. The recycling bin. They like the recycling. Of course, bin. yeah, that's that's usually the spot. <laughs> We've got two motorcycles, and they like to be under the covers, just like at a, on a grill. Yeah. They like yeah. to get up under the. <laughs> so, how long have you guys been realtors, realtors? Realtors. And me, 16, 16 years. And what did you do before this? Before I was a pastor. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Yep. I did a little bit of both for a while. Right. Real estate and, and, and ministry. Nice. That's an interesting swap. Yeah. And what did you do? Or what, how long have you been doing this, Mike? Um, ooh, eight years, but kind of my license. I mean, I did timeshare for 15 years. Wow. Yeah. Then, well, who? Uh, Wyndham and um, Diamond Resorts is now, but back then it was the Palms. Yeah. Uh -huh. Celebration, Mystic Blues Resort. Mm -hmm. I was there for the most, the biggest portion, nine years I was there. Yeah. And then there, oh, uh, Bonnie Creek, Orange Lake. No, I'm Shannon. Yeah. Oh, yes, you are. I had a, I'm I had a, Cyrus, uh, nice to meet you. I'll probably start one. Oh, yeah? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I'll probably start forgetting names as the room fills up. I already forgot Rocky's daughter's name. Ooh. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. I, I did a little bit of banking too. Did you? The TV bank. Uh, I did loans as well. Loan on phone. You did mortgages? I did mortgages for a while too. I did mortgage. I still kind of do. Yeah? I didn't like it. You gotta like That's a job that you need a lot of patience for. Yeah, I didn't like it at all. I don't mind it. I enjoy it. You do? Yeah. I, I, I worked with Jewelry and, and um, Danita for a while. Okay. Yeah. No, and, and, you know, knowing the whole loan process mm -hmm. kind of helps you, you know, both sides. Of it does. It does. As, as a realtor. <clears throat> Especially when lenders want to maybe give you a runaround or something like yeah. that. I know. Especially with the junk fees, too. Yeah. Hey, go with that. Yeah, go. Yeah. This entire presentation will be in English. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. How are you? No, oh, I know what you're saying. I, I grew up in Miami. No, I got enough. Uh, yeah. I can't do the big uh, whole thing like this. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm Shannon. Nice to meet Henry. Hi, Henry. Nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you. So, so you're like, how are you? Hello, Henry. Good, good. Good to meet you. Good to see 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 you. What's up, man? How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Well, I was really just North Miami. I don't know if it's really better. I was born in Jackson. My father ran all of the I mean, I need to go back and check the original three. I'm one of the original three. I'm one of the original three. Yeah. 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 You yeah. hardly see anything. My family was um, a jazz family. Jazz family was down now. Uh -huh. Get out of here. So we'll be wow. sending you those. My grandparents grew up right near the river. There's a hospital sitting on top of where the house is. Yeah, you're 
one of the unicorns. You've already seen like original, original, original. Si consigue el party, it's rare. Yo creo que ese va a ser un día. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad. Sometimes. I did, I did leave the state to go to graduate school. Did you? Yeah, and then I came back. Because it was too, too the cold. The was calling you, right? Yes. Oh. Depressing. Before we start, you want to go to get a soda? You okay? Water? I brought a water in case I got there. Well, they give me one of those. No, we have two of them. Yeah. Please. This one? Si, uno. In the cup, in the cup. I brought a water. Oh, no, I did not bring a water. The French hair looks like this. No, bueno, lo dice por 11, 11 ah, años, sí. pero, pero llegó un punto en que ya la, la conciencia ya... No, me mira, I have still like voices de 11 años, es el que más me espera. no, yeah, they lost. Well, we went to the beach once and we took the kids and we're like, what, what can we do? We go back to the hotel and we're like, I'll just pick up the fried chicken. The best thing. Oh my gosh, the best thing ever. It was a hit. Probably not for our health. No. Okay. Oh, really? Start getting really involved and informed via internet. Now they go there and they already know. Yeah. You know, there's no way now to kind of sell. Yeah. 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 Way, yeah. Adrian Sight. 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 No, that's more than yeah. That's more than yes. Yeah, the other one he shows up, but not as not as often. Do you do you work with Renier? Who? Renier. Orange light. Rings of Bell. Yeah, Renier is such a small world in that industry. You have no idea. This one was all mine, but I knew him for years. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he was it was for casualidad. He was the one who sold mine. Good guy, good guy. Yeah. But he did that for my God. I've been in touch with for more than three, four years. Fake media. And he did good, but by, by that time he was uh, he was about to get out. He was he was out. he was on his way out. Yeah, it was. 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 Yeah
Sorry. And to a restaurant. Again, so they stop at the time. So no, no. Sesenta, sesenta por ciento de gente. Sí, hay una inquilina y a veces sin ni siquiera mostrar. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
See, now this presentation is getting shorter and shorter because it's 10.15. Can we start? We can start. We can if start. You want to. Go ahead. Well, I know there's supposed to be people on the phone, too. Mm -hmm. Which that I don't know. Manuel, can you start the video? I don't know who's hearing me. Hello, people. Hello, Hello. 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 So we'll get the presentation from the oh, here, right? Oh, the Yeah, probably on the screen. That's my mom. Oh. Hey, mom. Oh. Oh. See that? She's like... <laughs> the authority <laughs> finger in there, yeah. <laughs> Like my buddy put there uh, sitting down. Oh, that's your brother right there. <laughs> Man, that's your brother right there. Yeah. He was right yeah. there. Was that the game the last time you guys went? Yeah. yeah. You, were, you were courtside, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Nice, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I don't want my son to get too spoiled with that. <laughs> <laughs> now he went all over really, courtside. Really but next week, you're going to be like, what? She wants the restaurant, the whole deal. You need the wristbands. Yes, yes, you get to walk out of the back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's let's start. Um, yes. We have the New York people already connected. Okay. And Hi, New York people. Obviously, uh, you word will be here about 30 minutes in about 25 <laughs> minutes or so. Hey, hey, you were after Well, you yeah, no, no. Here. Part of you were. <laughs> um, <laughs> And Hector and Gladys will be, uh, they, are, they are connected and they are on the way in, so they will see the, the whole presentation. Anyway, uh, Shannon Julian with BHB, she is the um, environmental development person there. Uh, I know Shannon for too many years to say, although I know her when on, on those days that she was in high school, so it's, it's not an age issue. Um, very good friend, but but also a, a an, an incredibly experienced environmental person uh, with that ability to see things and and figure out what the problems are or what the problems could be in the future. He's a gift. So I leave you with Shannon. Uh, obviously, throughout the process, I will put some bits and pieces of information that I want them to have it. Absolutely. So we it will be a, yeah, be a conversation, and, and obviously there. as she moves through the different sections, she will give us an opportunity to exchange questions and answers, so yeah. let's go ahead. Some you, sections, if you guys look forward, I'll try to speed up, but some <laughs> of this stuff is not that exciting. So I'm Shannon. Um, I started my career in 1992. I worked for the federal government uh, for an agency called that was then called the Soil Conservation Service. It's now the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I was doing project planning and a lot of mapping, some of the stuff we use today that got mapped by hand and then had to be put onto computers. We did a lot of that. Um, and then I moved, I left that job because I was left to go to grad school. And so I went to the University of Florida for my undergraduate de degree, which my main degree is in economics, not related to the environment. <laughs> Although I use it, you'd be surprised. Um, and my minor was in environmental science. Uh, but I realized I didn't want to sit behind a desk after I worked for the federal government, which is where everybody's butts were planted, and now I sit behind a desk. So anyways, I ended up getting my master's degree from Michigan State University in natural resource development. Uh, my thesis was really geared towards wetlands, so I'm really a trained ecologist, biologist, for more than there's some other fields that have environmental engineering and geologists and different things like that. But I started working with the Soil Conservation Service, so with soils, and then elevated my career all the way to doing bird surveys. So around the sky, pretty much, <laughs> is the gist. Um, so I've been doing this for 25 something years. So I worked for a company called VHB. When I met Rafi, I worked for a straight environmental firm. Now I work under an engineering firm that has environmental folks that work there. So we've got 1,300 people across the southeastern United States. Um, and maybe then another couple, like four, in Colorado, which are housed under the Orlando office. 
don't know why. Uh, the guy that actually started the Colorado office actually was in our Orlando office for a long time. And he still does projects in this area, but from Colorado. Um, so we were founded in 1979. We've been around a long time. Um, we do some of Raphael's engineering as well. Depends, you know, bigger projects. Tip, we'll do pretty much everything from transportation planning. He kind of talks about it a little bit. Land development, uh, so that's the, the civil side of engineering. We have architects, I mean, we have landscape architects, we have planners, environmental survey. So pretty much we do almost everything in house. Uh, we also do historical resources, but we don't do that much in Florida because we can use a sub that's cheaper. And so we're kind of really an interesting company in that we're not afraid to team with other people if it saves the client money, but we are definitely Pro development. We're not. We do sustainability work as well and sustainability planning. But we're really our jobs are to help get people from raw land to developed projects. Oh. Developed projects. And, and obviously, at this point in time, mm -hmm. I need to to say that uh, two very important things for us in Florida. Uh, one of the things that I do often with BHB is to handle uh, planning and zoning uh, efforts. We have the best fighters. Very, very good people, <laughs> very well prepared, and more than anything else, very capable of, of working around the system, which is what really is all about in Florida. Uh, for example, right now we are, they have a huge project, which is the, the, the very well known East Side Project, which is oh, yeah. uh, 600 and something acres, uh, 6,000 houses, oh. and so on. Um, for example, we piggyback with them on a smaller commercial project that we are doing there. So, so that's an area that, as we as you move into commercial properties, we will be most likely doing business with them on that area. Okay. And the, then the other thing that I want to add at this point in time is that for the New York office, um, we we just have a situation there that I was sharing with, with Shannon a couple of minutes ago, we, we are selling a church building that is 102 years old. Well, we find out that two additional lots next to this one, to the <coughs> west of this uh, church building, they sold the property and tear it, tear it down so they can build a new building. And when they finish up or start doing, doing the excavation, they find out a historic uh, site that was unknown for everybody. Wow. So now that has stopped that project completely on the tracks. They are they have a lot of things that they need to go ahead and do and, so and, that and get like county property now or something like that? Uh, well no, no it just goes through a lot of processes yeah. through um, basically it's a section wow. section four. There's a policy act called the National Environmental Policy Act, and so historic properties are protected under that. So now they've got to go through the process of dot all the documentation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they can't eventually rip it out, but you have to get it all documented and put in all the registry. Yes. And if we, if they are lucky enough that, for example, they find out that that is a. Uh, Indian side, uh, Native American uh -huh. side. Which I'm not going into today, but I could have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, then, then the whole thing changed because in some <laughs> cases what they do is they pull out the whole thing and reestablish it in another area so they don't lose the historic value of that. Yeah. So it, but it's, for, for, the, the reason we why I mentioned this people. is that for the New York people, although we and have people? some of these cases here. Yeah. I remember in Miami, I was doing a project in Miami about 12, 20 years ago, and, and we have an issue of, of a uh, uh, underground burial site. burial site, and you know we have to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. But for the New York guys, um, BHV is in New York, as you can see on the plan, they are pretty much everywhere on the East Coast. So they will be also helping us on those areas. So go ahead. Yep. And we hope to. So, but yes, I have moved people. We actually another weird thing we moved one time in Ocala was a um, a racehorse that had won the Kentucky Derby. So it created a because his burial was in Ocala, where it's a lot of horse parts, oh, wow. and it created a historical situation. So we actually wow. had to dig up the horse and move him to another. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane what we do. Trust me, that's it's crazy. always exciting and strange. Never done. I know that's that's no. something. 
All right, so we're going to talk about environmental due diligence. And I know you guys are commercial, so typically for Rafi, I work with raw, mostly raw land. But I'm going to add in some pieces of redevelopment sites and that kind of thing as we talk. So we're going to cover quite a few, well, we're going to talk about due diligence first, which you guys probably know as realtors. I hopefully that they've taught you that in, in school. But basically what we're trying to do is, you know, educate our buyers. I can remember one of the first jobs Rafi and I worked on, the client, and it's still a project that's not developed, which is terrible, but this gentleman came, he's a foreign foreigner, he came, he doesn't know anything about buying property in Florida. For 20 years I've been talking about writing a book called How to Buy Land in Florida, <laughs> because people are dumb. They, oh, this is cheap, let's buy it. Well, he had 75% of his site is wetlands, with wetlands that discharge into the little econ. So it's very hard to develop this site. It's not an easy piece of property. So I, he, I told him, if you're going to buy more land, let's do some due diligence. So he sends me on the next property to Polk County. And I go out there and I come back and I said, don't buy this property. You're buying 100 acres, of which one half an acre, half an acre is uplands, and there are three e bald eagle's nests on the property. Oh, and he okay. says to me, I already bought it. Oh. I don't know how many times I can teach you how important it is to know what you're buying before you buy it. And then he did another one. I've done and three. did you update them on how much it costs to move an eagle? Well, eagles, you don't, you can do a take permit to get an eagle done. You have to do three, two mitigated measures. One of them is starts at $35,000 just what? for that, the fee. Oh, so then you've got your consultants, you've got all the paperwork, the permit, get it, all, getting all the permits. It's insane. What that red tape for, for, for an eagle? For an eagle, wow. right. So we are going to talk about... eagle nest. Yeah. yeah. Because if the nest is there, even though the eagle may not be right now at the nest, uh -huh. there is... Or you can wait if you want to save that $35,000 plus... Yeah, you can wait two years and have somebody document it every season to say that the eagles are not there and that the nest is abandoned. But you're going to sit on That's your property say, for two a, years. Put a, put a live <laughs> camera on YouTube. Two years. Watch the eagle. So yeah, Make so now, you're, now your investors are stuck. Yeah, for two years. Another two years. So it's very much. Yeah, so it's very much buyer beware. The biggest problem that I have with with folks talking about due diligence is. And, and your clients, is it's money out of their pocket up front. And they're like, why do we spend this money? Well, there's a prime yeah. example. Three eagles' nests and half an acre of uplands. What are you going to do with that property? It's worth nothing. Don't I don't care if you got it at fire sale prices. It's yeah. worth nothing without putting a lot more money into it. What about the, me, yeah. what about the now um, in Wicker Park, the, the, oh, the, the, the peacocks. peacocks. Oh, peacocks are not native to the yeah. to the state of Florida, so no, you, they can. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. such a big deal to catch them and put them somewhere else. That's mm, but it's just else. a little bit of money. It's not a big permitting process. I'll mm -hmm. show you all the animals that are a big deal tonight. Mm -hmm. So inspections are voluntary. You don't have to do due diligence, but you should. Um, I always tell clients if you're buying a piece of property as well. Think about the fact that if what you know can help you renegotiate the price. Because if the seller really, there are times, sometimes I think most of the sellers know what they have, personally, but there are times when there's people that have bought property from other states and they just are holding on to it as an investment. They have no idea what's out there. I mean, all the bank foreclosures, when the recession happened, the banks don't know what they had. They were paying me money left and right to go tell them what, they, what is in my portfolio and is, what is it really worth now. So it's always a good idea, especially if you find something that's going to cost you money, to do due diligence. Environmental due diligence, we can kind of give you estimates, so you can kind of re tell your clients let, to go back and renegotiate the price. Leverage, yeah. yeah. And then it also helps, you know, especially the development clients that are building the commercial properties and investing, you know, to put their performance together and to really understand their timelines. If they don't have a, you know, like I have some clients that are national retail chains, and so if they're building a warehouse, you would be surprised how quickly they want us to do these things. And then, so if they don't do their due diligence where we can say, hey, this permit right here is gonna take me nine months to get. I can't meet your time frame. you're gonna lose your buyer. So start backing up, we'll start working on the project, but you know, you gotta understand your timelines because some mm -hmm. things just can't be done. And, and something that we need to be very much aware as representative for sellers, is that when we have properties, uh, 
obviously they can land is, is one, one of the main ones. When we have properties that we're going to put on the market that are properties that have a high price and that you are selling for development projects, you need to do some invest some of this money, meaning the, the seller, mm -hmm. on, on, on due diligence ahead of time if they want to sell it right yeah. and if they want to sell it on time. If not, mm -hmm. if you leave that to the buyer, it will, it will, yeah. it will hold the property with one <coughs> potential client for three to six yeah, months. Yeah, then you're holding diligence. up your money on that side. You are absolutely right. I'm glad mm -hmm. you're interjecting all of this important stuff to bridge these gaps. Mm -hmm. So... Basically, we're going to go over tonight is knowing some of the regulations. You're not going to know all the regulations. That's my job. That's what we call you. Yeah, that's why you call me, and then I spend a lot, of, and I give you free advice until my bosses say, "Why aren't you making yeah. any money?" Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about contamination issues, all in relation to due diligence, geotech, wetlands and mitigation, wildlife, floodplains. I should have taken water quality off. We're not going to talk about water quality. You really don't have to do that in due diligence. I was going to just kind of talk about it in the realm of permitting. Um, but I don't think we're going to have enough time, and it's not in the PowerPoint anyway. I forgot to change that. I changed that to permit searching because that was something Rafael wanted me to go over. So as you guys probably are aware, legislative updates keep coming. So one of my jobs is to follow all the environmental legislative updates that will affect us. So one of the biggest ones right now, if you haven't heard about it, is right now when we do any type of permitting for wetlands or ditches, which are called other surface waters, ponds, natural ponds, lakes, we go through this process called the environmental resource process, permitting process. And we do that for the state, and then it's duplicative. We do it for the federal government. They have different regulations on the definition of wetlands, and they have different permit processes. Now, at one point, everything came together and we submitted one application to the water management districts. Do you guys know about the water management districts and their roles? We'll talk about that in a little while. But we put we we put all of our permits there, then they would copy the Corps of Engineers, which is the federal regulators. Well, last year the Corps of Engineers decided that that process was too onerous and they weren't getting copied enough on things, so they've separated the processes again. So you have an application for basically a very similar application. A little bit of different things go into it, so there's different fees. They are still separate fees because they have different questions and different things you have to answer. Um, but the state of Florida said, this is ridiculous. Number one, the Corps of Engineers is the, is the, the uh, agency that takes forever. <coughs> they have no timelines. You submit an application, you go into the pile of papers. And there you sit. And then you call. And you call. And clients say, why do you have such a high fee on just consultation? Do you know how many times I have to call the Corps? I'm trying to get a pre-application meeting with the Corps. I submitted a it, the forms a month ago. My client from, is from out of state, will be here next week. I still haven't heard. Mm -hmm. Following up, sending emails, phone calls, like, well, are you going to say yes or no to my dates that I proposed? You know, they just don't have any time frames. Especially if your impacts are greater than one acre of wetlands or surface waters. If you're under that, it can be a little bit more streamlined. But I have had big projects in the Corps of Engineers for two years. I have a project at the airport that's been in the Corps of Engineers for five years. My water management district permit expired before my core permit was issued, and we submitted the core permit before we submitted the water management district. So that's the big, right now, that is the big issue. If, so if the state of Florida, the governor signed it, takes over, it's going to take us a while, but if they take over all the federal jurisdiction, there's a lot of fine lines to work out, um, then we'll be back to one overall permitting process through the state. Now the state will still have to coordinate with other federal agencies, which the Corps does now, um, and we'll talk about that too. But that's a big deal in the state of Florida to help our development process, process speed up because the Corps, like I said, takes forever. So another thing that you really need to know about, especially if you're talking with clients and that are on the buying side, but even your clients that are trying to sell land, is, is what, are the, what are the codes and ordinances that could affect them? Again, you can call our planners, you can call us, uh, it just depends, the environmental department. We kind of split some of these things. But redevelopment has a whole set of problems. Are you on a non-conforming lot? Do you have enough stormwater? Come on in. Do you have enough trees? Because now if you go to redevelop a site, are you going to have, no, go ahead, you're good. 
are you going to have to conform to the, to the code today versus what it was then? And then raw land, same thing. Are you zoned properly? You know, what are your set-asides for open space? What is, you know, um, do you have tree issues? I mean, there's a whole bunch of ordinance codes and ordinances that are really important, but then we've got how many counties and cities in this area. So there's a lot to know. It's almost impossible. I mean, I have to look up code all the time because I can't remember which one's which. You know, is this guy's trees? Are they protected at six inches? Or are they protected at eight inches? It's and Shannon, uh, a lot. We, have, we have been dealing with a case uh, where uh, we have been looking at a development that happens that was approved and built in terms of infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, 10, 12 years ago. Okay. Um, the project was was hold because of several reasons, but right. now they are interested in selling, and, and obviously when originally there was something that the beauty find out, and we said, oh, this is nice, it's, it's old construction, at old prices, this will be a, an easy sell. Well, the more I dig into the transaction, mm -hmm. the more we find out that permits are uh, expired. 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 That's if you reapply for the permit, there's new requirements. There is completely new requirements, and mm -hmm. she can tell you how often the regulations change. I was going to say, all is that something time. that it changes it's, constantly? It's, it's a constant, constant change, change all the time. Yes, I mean you could spend your entire life going to city meetings to hear all the changes that are going on <laughs> all the time. So if the, if the permit is active, then you don't have to go through that. Correct. You may yeah. have to modify your permit if you're changing you what yeah, if you're changing what was engineered, but if your permit is still active, you are pretty much grandfathered under that okay. permit. They so have to hold that. Right. And for example, in the case of Cusiela County, when we approach them to, to talk about the possibility of what will it take to, to renew that, that uh, permit, basically what they came out and say is, well, really, you have to do a completely new permit. Wow. Yeah, start over. <laughs> and, Your and permit's then, expired, then, you start over. You know, that throw out wow. the baby with the... Yeah, <laughs> so you don't have... So basically, you have no entitlements. So yeah. your, your land your, price and your, 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 you know, your price should be... Because you've got to spend so much money with consulting and everything to get everything up to speed. I believe it or not, it's more expensive to change something that has expired than doing it new from the region. It can be, yeah. It just depends how far along it is. Yeah. So we, we were looking at one piece of property close to us, fourth is on it now, but everybody stops seeing the eagle nest right now. Of course. Yeah. So that's, that has been baked then with the S30. That's 35,000. One eagle, four more. <laughs> Um, you can you yeah. can avoid. There are ways to avoid. It depends where it is on the property and how it's situated. It's in the middle of the property. Oh, oh. The middle right there. Everybody so see it. yeah. So basically, Everybody there are two protection zones. We're skipping all over the place. We're never going to make it through this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's better to have interaction. You know, and if we've got to slide through the silly things faster. But since we're talking about eagles, we'll talk about them now. So there's a protection zone of 660 feet. Wow. You cannot do any development within 660 feet of the eagle's nest during the nesting season, which is November to May. <laughs> Unless, if you have someone out there monitoring your eagle, someone like me, environmental professional, that is documenting the eagles and their activities, it starts off at one day a week until they start laying eggs. Wow. And then it's three days a week for several months, and then it goes once the e the babies have hatched, it goes back to one day a week until they fly. Once they fly, you're done. But I have a home builder right now. No lie, we did all their environmental work. The site was clean. Moved gopher tortoises. Did skink surveys. Everything was clean. Did all the wetland work. Clean and clear, ready to go. They start. They started clearing the land. And burning all the trees, you know, burning some of the junky trees. And in comes two eagles. <laughs> oh, oh, no way! On a pine tree that no lie. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so we lost, we lost four lots. Oh, my God. And for oh, wow. two years, they have probably spent oh. almost close to $10,000 a month to have us out there monitoring so they can keep doing construction. Up to 330 feet. I'm in the wrong field. So they did a eminent domain? Yes. So 
It's not that lucrative, trust me. We probably make the least amount of money in the company because nobody wants to pay for what we do. Think about that. Oh my gosh, I have a problem. I don't want to pay for that. Let's make it go but away. But it makes sense to do, like you said, to do it before and handle well, all that stuff before, yeah. before, before you even. Keep in mind, though, animals are mobile. Yeah. So yeah. crap happens. You know, it just, you know, oh so we're God. burning and they're still building the nest. I'm like, what are they doing in all this smoke? And we're watching these things build a nest. I'm like, no. So we put our perimeters around it. Once the nesting season ends, so these, the babies, this is the second year, two babies were born. <laughs> so it takes, it takes a they whole year they were they were well, the the bay. Bay. You have to, no, oh. but, but during the nesting season, November mm -hmm. to May, you can't go within... 330 mm -hmm. feet of the nest, if, unless you're monitoring. Oh I've got somebody out there watching. The monitoring people, the environmental professional, can stop the construction. Wow. Are required to stop the construction oh if the eagles are bothered. You can't disrupt them at all. Wow. So, so anyways, the people. moral of the story is they fledged. Now they can start construction with up to 100 feet of the tree. So no roofing. Some of the outside work is the bad stuff. The real noisy, you know, trusses, and that's really, you know, or bridges when they're putting the pilings yeah. in. It really, I mean, these eagles clearly are urban eagles. It's what we call them. They're used to people and activity, so it's not bothering them. So they've been doing construction, and as long as it's not bothering them, we don't stop the construction. But we have to be out there. So wow. it is expensive, but this particular builder has other properties with eagles, and they find them to be an asset eventually. I mean, they lost four lots. That's a pretty good chunk of change. But they move their open space around a little bit, and then their residents, they've got a trail on the back anyway, so their residents, it's kind of like it's a curve to some of the residents until the eagles poop all over the house. Yeah. That's not so it's a selling point. We have all the eagles. Yeah. Wow. So soil stability, that's kind of the geotech stuff. State and, and uh, federal and state wetland and water quality regulations. Of course, floodplains are a big deal and protected species. So kind of get into these kinds of things. So these are, this is just, I'll skip right over this because you guys probably know this, but some of the major land code things to know um, is, are these things? Because these are really things that affect your, mm -hmm. your growth. And you gotta love this, the, the project Rafi was talking about earlier, the big housing development off of Lake Pickett, you know, we had this whole no growth problem where the commissioners are like, we don't want any growth in that yeah. area. And then you have the residents. NIMBY is the not in my backyard thing. Yeah. The residents, <laughs> yeah, they don't want, you know, the residents that live on one side of the road are like, we're rural. We don't want a housing development next to us. So we had to jump through a lot of hoops. I had to design a hundred foot natural buffer on the edge of Lake Pickett Road. And then I forget what the other northern road is called, Rollerson Road, something like that. <laughs> But we had a 100-foot buffer, and then we had to put large lots all up along the roadway so that those two people were, the, the conforming lots were similar. So it's a lot of planning and moving things around. But these are really kind of the most important things to know. So we'll start off with contamination. We call this the ooey-gooey stuff. This is not what I do, nor do I like it. It is boring. Um, but it needs to be done, uh, especially as, if you've got a site that <coughs> maybe one of these redevelopment sites that's already been active, already had tenants in it. Really, re I can't tell you how important this is, especially if a strip mall or some type of thing like that's ever had a dry cleaner in it, a paint store, mm -hmm. um, some kind of automotive store, mm -hmm. or automotive place. repair. Yeah. All of these things are red flags. Agricultural sites, wait, who's talking about the horses? Talking about the mm -hmm. horses? Mm -hmm. Agricultural sites can also be a big red flag because you, when you start thinking about what we call an ESA, an environmental site mm -hmm. assessment, if you're an ag, you're already you're ticking a box because, guess, ag uses chemicals. So you're ticking a box. What's going to be out there? What am I going to find? So phase one, that's typically what you do in the due diligence process. And I can tell you, Florida Hospital, Orlando Health, any of the big major builders will never ever start even thinking about building on a piece of property without doing this. Now phase ones are really important. ASTM is the, was the American Society of um, Testing and Materials. It's not American anymore, it's international. These are in, kind of international standards. So there's three phases that you can go through. Phase one, like I said, is kind of what you do in due diligence. Phase two happens 
I'll probably say this on the next slide, I have no idea. Um, but phase two happens if you find something in the phase one, you need to do additional investigation. Phase threes happen um, really when you're trying to get into remediation and cleanup. So that's kind of mitigation, if you will. How do we offset? How do we clean this site up? Um, but ASTM is who kind of put together the contamination list. Now, it doesn't cover everything, per se. There are quantities of contaminants that are legal. So if there's things that are legal to a certain level, some of those things don't come up. But the biggest thing is the intent is to qualify of doing a phase one is it qualifies the landowner against liability. And this is a federal rule under CERCLA. <clears throat> and it per can protect the landowner, a contiguous property owner, like say you were next to a gas station and the gas station's tank broke and the plume of oh. gas goes next door and now you got contamination under your property. Guess what? You own it. It's mm. your property. They're responsible for the cleanup but you kind of have some, if you come in and buy it, and that's there, you're responsible for the cleanup now. So that can cost tons of money. Um, and it also is for uh, bona fide pers per, uh, prospective purchasers, but that one has limits. So if you're, you're in the purchase process and something happens, and you've done a phase one, during that the time between agreements and closing, you do have some limited liability. The liability is, on the federal level, um, and I'm not going to go into all the details about it, but it, ha it affords your client protection. I can tell you that in several cases of redevelopment sites, old truck stops, those kinds of things, this has been a major deal. Breaker. You know, very expensive to clean up underground tanks from especially uh, gas stations. And, and something very important on this stage of the game is that uh, in today's market, you cannot get a 500,000 or more financing on commercial property without a phase one. Correct. Simply, you cannot get it. It, it won't fly. On their 500,000, there are ways to work around that. Sure. But, but no way that you can get uh, through a commercial financing 500,000 or more without a phase one. Which That's brings it. me to another topic. Because the banks in Florida, maybe on the next slide, maybe not. I have very proposed. So the banks in Florida have lower standards than the federal standards. So when I'm talking about a phase one to ASTM standards, you have to use the all appropriate inquiries or AAIs. Um, and that means you have to do the whole background research. Some of the banks in Florida have a limited phase one so that you don't have to spend a lot of money. Not that phase ones are that expensive. They're around 25. The, the real cost of a phase one should be around $2,500. There are firms that are mom and pop shops that charge 17, but if you don't go to the federal level of your, on your phase one, you have no protection against future liability or current liability. Mm -hmm. And anytime you buy a site with contamination, again, you buy it, you own it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you're responsible. Um, so what the um, rec uh, CERCLA does is it actually defines the recognized environmental conditions and it kind of talks about what you're looking for. Likely presence even is included. That's why agricultural properties, you get that first checkbox already on phase one, because it is, like, it is likely to have some situation. Um, and it basically gives you the definition. And again, that's what I would, oh, it is on this slide. There are separate federal, state, and local laws. AIs cover the, all the basic federal laws that give you the liability protection. State, state one's not so strict. Ask your consultant if they're going, you know, what level they're going to. You want it all, and most of the reputable ones will do, do it to the federal level. But and, and just for the record, for the New York guys that are with us tonight, uh, the the phase one in Manhattan. No, that one might be more expensive. It's, it, it's, out of it's on the neighborhood of the seventy five hundred dollars. That makes probably more sense to yeah. start with. Usually, the last five or six that we have done have been on the ten to twelve thousand dollars. So wow. that's. Just but you've got to think facts. about the history there, yeah. too. Yeah. There's a lot more There's history lot more there history. than there are in Flo yeah. there is in Florida. We have had a lot of raw land for a long, long time. And then, but on the other side, you think back again to the ag properties, how many chemicals do we use down here in agricultural practices that are really bad, that are banned now? So there's a lot of things to look out for. And then with ag properties, too, if you've got tractors and different things like that, and they've had 
big thing is above and below ground storage tanks. And that, some of that stuff is, is not easy to find, but back in the day, we heated with these, this oil in tanks, and it was buried a lot of times next to the side of the house. Well, if it, it never was taken out and it leaked down. I've actually had a property uh, in Ormond Beach that was an old historic home, and they were going to renovate it, and it really was going to cost too much, so they went to start to take the house out, same thing. Oh my gosh, this tank had leaked. This house actually had a basement, believe it or not, in Florida. And so like, basically underneath the entire basement was a huge plume of oil wow. that had to all be dug up, had to be put in bins, has to be shipped out to a certain place. So when you get to that level of remediation, even that project that we were taught, the first yeah. project with 75% wetlands I was talking yeah, about with the fire, in the very front of the property, it had been agricultural, <laughs> belong colonial. There and we had, bin. I think we trucked out we six... Have to remove six yeah. bins of dirt that had to go to Georgia. Yeah. Wow. So it was, I mean, if that project wasn't the end of the world, but there are some. There's another project I have in Bradenton right now. There was a dry cleaner that yeah. all of their stuff flushed through the, went, they basically were just draining it out the back door. Wow. Went into a drainage uh, grate, and it's completely under the adjacent property. The plume is by itself is three acres. It has been studied, the water quality has been studied for 17 years. Ooh. It's still not below levels. Now, what they decide, the client decided to do was put portions of it under a conservation easement and put restrictions on the development over top of it. Because you can't dig. I mean, what if a kid puts his hand down there and eats the dirt? I mean, it's terrible. I mean, you gotta dig waste, but still, you have to protect the end users. And so, for those of us that, that do small residential developments, and Judy, this is extremely important for you, uh, as small as six, seven, eight acres, uh, look at what happened on here on Todd Road in, in Winter Springs. Small farm, mom and pop operation, 40, 50 uh, heads of cattle, cattle mm -hmm. throughout the year, nothing much. But they have this small barn with a over-the-ground uh, diesel tank. And obviously every time they put diesel on the tractor, a couple Spills. of drops came in and so on. Oh well, after uh, KB Homes purchased a property, <laughs> they spent $400,000 between the cleanup and the permit initials. Yep. 400000 on a seven and a half acre. Yep. That tells you what the prices the end prices of the properties were when, <laughs> when they were able yeah. to finish it. Yeah, yeah. Then they got to build high end homes. <laughs> exactly. On little tiny lots. <laughs> right, to be able to cover the fees. Right. So it, it's, it is crazy and it happens. And on, on the cattle side, on the livestock side too, back in the day there was also these things called cattle dipping bags. Mm -hmm. And they're buried. You can't wow. see them now with the name. There's been a few that I have found in, with the naked eye that are really silted in, but you figure all the dirt and leaves and stuff pile up. So these things, they were V-shaped, and they would run the cattle through them and soak them in arsenic. And that's what killed all the mosquitoes and ticks and kept away the diseases. Well, of course, that's terrible. And now the arsenic, arsenic stays in the soil a long time. We also used arsenic on abandoned landfills, or in landfills long ago. So if you have a site and a lot of landfills that were really old or not documented well, mm -hmm. and so you get on top of a landfill that used arsenic, you are doomed. I mean, wow. it is, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. They try to map all the cattle dipping bats, but they don't know where they all are. So a lot of counties have that data, but not all of them. So compliance with ASTM or AAIs, um, the reviews have to be completed by an environmental professional. So if there's, a, there's a stamp that goes on these reports. Um, and the one thing that's really strange about phase ones, and they take a little while, they're not, people are like, okay, I've got this property, I need this phase one ASAP. Well, it's a minimum two week process. You've got to do the field visit. You've got to order what's called an uh, EDR report. It's a report that basically a database company sends you that researches all the history of the property, which you could never do quickly. They've just created a database. You've got to search property, old property records old library, you've got to do library searches, you've got to send questionnaires to all, try to find as many of the old owners as you can, send questionnaires, you've got to question the fire department, you've got to question the pub, Department of Public Health, all these interviews have to be done. But it is required that any of the previous landowners, if they know things, they are required by law to 
tell you. Mm -hmm. they don't Can they get in trouble? It would be like if they, they don't trust back and be like, let me tell you that I have a site where SunTrust Bank was involved and a home, a landowner did not disclose something, and SunTrust had them in court for wow. seven and a half years, and SunTrust won. Wow. So but it took seven and a half years. years. But SunTrust has a deep pocket, so right. they don't care. They're going to take right. you. So, yes, that, that actual person ended up in jail oh, oh. for non disclosure. Wow. wow. It was it wasn't a small piece of property, by the way, but still, you know, they knew it was there and they knew they didn't do, yeah. do the right things. And I've even had sales of, of old manufacturing plants, um, Tropicana suntan oil, mm -hmm. where they had all their um, above ground storage tanks, but they had no con. The rule is the law is to have concrete below it, so it gets the concrete, not the ground. They were still operating well into the two thousands with no concrete substructures and then here comes Playtex to buy the suntan lotion place and mm -hmm. oh my gosh what a mess that was I mean that mess I mean that almost messed up the sale so it was it and then Playtex got it and now it's under yeah. Energizer and I have been Playtex in Florida. was protecting themselves from the liability I have been in Florida commercial real estate for 27 years and there has not been one single year where I don't have a client that have come to me and said I want to purchase that old gas station close on the corner of such and such street those closed gas stations 99% of them are never contaminated the because test. they were they single never. tank mm -hmm. containers not not liner tanks so it's it costs you a fortune. Wow. Most most people walk around. <clears throat> Even new gas stations that have old gas stations will build a new one across the street and let the bank, you know, work. It's not worth it. It's not. It, I mean, it, somebody eventually cleans it up. And there are dollars to help people that. There are people in this business that find sites to clean up because there's tax incentives and things like that that come with it. But it is not an easy road. What about the the so. What, for example, the schools mm -hmm. in Orlando, that is a school that they found um, ammunition. Oh, yes. When, I, how do you handle that? That should have been found in a phase one mm -hmm. because metals will <laughs> show up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That school, yeah. Yeah, that school was years built years ago. Or it was, but the school yeah. was built a long time ago, too. And so then they started to go and do additions to enlarge the school. And that's when they find mm. they were not all that ammunition was the not in an area that was used originally for that school. Some bacon and but yes, houses. it happens, especially same thing. Old, oh, We have a lot of small areas with old military mm -hmm. installations, yeah. Yeah. and they, they, they shot stuff. They, there's mine. There are still mine. there's mines everywhere. There are many people Colonial. that they don't trust Baldwin Park. Baldwin Park. Yeah. Yeah. That was a Navy base. Yeah. And many people said, I don't mm -hmm. like the place. Yeah. 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 But the place. one good thing sometimes in the mitigation when you get to the cleanup mm -hmm. phase, pavement is almost mitigation. If you can't dig down and get to the junk, you're not right. going to get it. The biggest part is usually when it's in the water quality stuff. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have wells. You can't, you know, there's a lot of, you can't dig your ponds too deep into that plume. There's a lot of conditions that come on there for your drainage, your irrigate. You can't, you know, have irrigation in those areas where it starts spreading it out but a lot of times like with the cattle dipping bags if you pave over it you might have to scrape out some ar arsenic but if you pave over it you're kind of limiting your liability because it's hard to get to mm -hmm. we do the same thing with archaeological resources pavement is mitigation That's because you can't go dig up that historical resource yeah. now because you've got to break through the concrete so that's that's an interesting that's situation. Amazing. So there's a couple of things that we do. Like I said, phase twos are when you know something's coming, you might have to do that next phase. And then you are getting up there in the pricing um, structure. So usually I would say 75, for us, phase two, 7,500 is a good starting point. 10 is probably an average, but it does go up to probably even 15 in some cases, depending on what you're sampling. Phase two. Because you might have to, yeah, because you may have to do more lab, te you have to do lab testing on the soils. You may have to install groundwater wells to see where is, you know, how, you have to basically figure out what is the extent of the contaminant. So, so when the client like pays for phase one, mm -hmm. what's what's usually the time frame that that takes to do a phase I one? I mean, two weeks is, a, is kind of around the norm. I'd say if you kick it off, it's really a good idea to give people about three weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, depending, but two weeks is is usually what we tell people. Like, that's really pushing it to get mm -hmm. everything going, but not unheard of. 
I I mean, even a month is reasonable. So, you know, if you're in if you're in a due like diligence, a especially commercially, I'm sure you yeah. guys aren't saying, "Hey guys, give me a 10 day due diligence." You're going to look <laughs> at 30 to 90 yeah. days. Just don't wait a long time to order it if somebody wants one. You mm -hmm. know, same thing with what I do. Don't wait a long. I have people that say, "I'm in 90 due, 90 day due diligence. I have 10 days left. Can you go do this?" Like, yeah, I have a schedule. You know. Yeah. And the positive thing about this is that I have few cases in the past where I have used the environmental phase one mm -hmm. uh, situation to win time to close the transaction. Yes. Uh, because the same way that it takes about two to three weeks, you can ask, I can call uh, Shannon and tell, listen, I need this report for uh, May 30th. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the closing have to be extended that day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, Costly and so on, but sometimes it's the only alternative that you have to be able to mm -hmm. save the, the transaction. He always gets people to do things by saying, I need this. That's how he got me here tonight. I need <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill you. I need you to. That's a good, good so way familiar. to get into things. <laughs> so geotechnical engineering is something that can be done in due diligence, mm -hmm. and it really depends on the development. Um, geotechnical engineering is really studying the soil suitability of what you're putting there, especially on raw land. But on redevelop I'm probably talking way ahead of my slides again. <laughs> but on redevelopment sites too, if you start to see like problem areas, uh, maybe you've got pavement that you see that's not holding up. There could be problems underground that you don't know about. So a lot of times it's really still a good idea to, to do some, some geotechnical work. The kicker is, is if you do it in due diligence, you are likely going to have to do more later once you get your site planning together. So the purpose of it is to really discover the risks because the geotechnical people are really there to assist uh, the next process of the development. And, and to pay a little bit for a couple of drillings uh, to get some idea of what is happening is a lot less expensive than getting to that point and not having them and figuring out that you have an issue. Plus your engineer can move forward a little bit more even with preliminary geotech. Um, for instance, we design ponds. Like typically we want the borings, uh, the civil engineers and the stormwater engineers want the borings to be where the ponds are gonna be to see what's the depth of the water table. See, the wind all this stuff. <laughs> That's why we don't talk. We give you all the information up here. We don't say everything, but it's silly. Um, but it, it does involve drilling some holes. I think the last one we did for Rafi had two boring holes. I think it was around four thousand four five hundred dollars, four thousand forty five hundred dollars, depending on where and how deep they've got to go. Um, they then throw all the soils through labs. Most most of the geotechnical firms have labs in house, so it's not going anywhere else and that helps the chain of command. Um, and then they they report their findings and they tell you everything you could ever want to know about what's going on in your dirt. Um, like I said, there could be some future additional studies. And the other thing geotechnical people do, they can be at the end of the project also doing construction oversight, which is really important. Because when you think about what you're talking oh, hey. <laughs> what you're talking about is headers, oh, down here. See, I put so much on here. You're talking about things that help you decide how much fill do you need on a property, which also allows you to figure out how much it's gonna mm -hmm. cost. So there's a lot of times people buy property and all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh. I, you know, they have no idea until the geotech, they've bought the property, they've engineered the property, then they find out they need eight feet of fill. Well, that's millions of dollars mm -hmm. to put eight feet of fill on a piece of property. So if you just drive a mile and a half from here, the new project on, the, on Tosca I, that is they are they are up to nine foot of field. It's crazy. On a hundred and ninety acre track of land. That will cost but you know that you know that used to be uh, a butcher house. Then it went to a church, and then the rest was cattle and horses and stuff like that. And now they bought all that piece of ground. I'm like, they keep on just dropping and dropping. I'm like, how much are they going to put in there? It's higher than the road right now. And if that's what you're supposed to be. And that we'll talk about with floodplains. So, um, so yeah, so they kind of tell you that. They also tell you your soil conditions. So how, if you're going to build a warehouse or a two-story building or a ten-story building, they're kind of telling you what, they're telling the civil engineers how much footing and structural engineers that you need. Wow. You know, what is your footing, you know, how deep do you have to go till you hit solid ground? You know, in California, you know, they drill 
I don't know, 60 feet into the bedrock. Here we don't have that problem with sandy soils, but you don't want to have a sinkhole issue. Yeah. Heaven mm -hmm. forbid, your whole yeah. build, you build, start building the building and it falls into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> or even if it falls into the ground two years later. I mean, yeah. these poor people in Tampa. properties, if you are building an industrial structure that will, that will require a very uh, dense uh, mm -hmm. foundation, mm -hmm. uh, if, and you, your ground cannot hold it, then you have to compact and so on, so it will add a significant amount of, pro of mm -hmm. uh, cost to that. That's what happened pretty much in all uh, Vista, Le 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 Vista Le Vista Le Vista. They have to put a lot of fill and so on and compacting because the ground there was not, not solid enough. enough. And so again, we also use it to determine the depths our ponds can be, and then we also use it, think about some of the slopes you're building on your ponds, retaining walls, all of these things, this, these geotechnical engineers and this data helps everyone figure out. So you don't do it, eventually you're going to, if you move forward with any civil engineering, you are going to do it, because you're going to have to know. We can't. There's not a single, I don't know many civil engineers that would stamp anything without oh. having all of this information. Yeah. All right, so this is really wetlands and wildlife and it's pretty much what I do on a daily basis. And it's fun, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> there's not a single commercial, there's not a single person buying land that ever asked me to delineate wetlands in the wintertime. When do you want me to delineate, delineate a wetland? In the friggin' summertime, when it's been raining, <laughs> and I gotta dig more pits and have dirty hands all the time, but that's the way it goes. Uh, it's very rare that through the winter we're doing uh, any did weather. Do you understand why she's saying that? Why? Because why? on winter, it's all dry. Summer, it's dry. Winter Hello. is very dry, so yes. the water table it's is no very wet. <laughs> so you have better possibilities of getting a better Smaller outcome. lines. But if you More do it in, in May, June, where, where oh, yeah. you have rain, three weeks of rain, rain. Yeah. the oh, water yeah. table is right there. Now, now the, that doesn't, the rain does not really dictate the wetland line because what it does is increase the price a little bit because I have to let the soil dry for 24 hours to really see what's going on. Yeah. If it's wet and dark and I can't tell, it, and I'm with an agency and I haven't done my homework, they're going to take it from me all day long and say, oh, you, you got the wetland here, we think it's way up here. Mm. And so it's really important. So basically I'm giving you blah, blah information about who does <laughs> what. <laughs> And what laws it is in, so you have, if you ever need to refer to the Florida Administrative Code or the federal code on where things are, um, that's where it is. Local governments, completely different. Obviously, Orange County is our hand in the rump since they have their own environmental process, which hmm. other, they're not alone. There's other counties that do it. But now you think about, I'm permitting the same thing three times. That's what I'm doing. Three times, different agencies. So um, there's also different regulations on how much you can impact from the city. Local governments may have added protection, and they're allowed to. Um, so this is where we start. And so the basic gist of a wetland is a wetland is defined by three categories. Soils is the first thing, and it's the top six inches of soil. So usually we're digging up. Sometimes we're probing because it's faster. <laughs> But in the initial phases when we're trying to figure out what's going on, we're digging basically a cone, a pit, and we're looking at the top six inches. And when you start having really dark areas, muck, mm -hmm. and you can do this if you were with a client and you were wondering, is this a wetland? If you even just take two or three inches off the top of the soil and you go like this and it feels more creamy, buttery, you've probably got wetland soils. Doesn't mean you have a wetland, but that's the first thing you need. Mm -hmm. So this is a dark surface and this area where it starts to strip out, we call it stripped out, is where the water table is moving up and down. So if your water table is moving up and down within six inches, you also have wetland soils. Mm. So there's a couple of other things lot that are, get more detailed into soil science, but that's part of my job is to figure that out. That's the hardest part. Um, vegetation is the second parameter. Um, so vegetation is classified in different ways. Uplands, then there's these weird words called fact which is facultative. So fact plus is closer to uplands, fact minus, there's a fact in the middle, fact minus is closer to wetlands, and then uh, obligate species are wets, they usually grow in wet, wet, wet stuff. And then the third parameter is hydrology. Now you do not have to, this is the biggest misnomer, you do not have to have wetland water to have a wetland. 
clearly if the soil is wet in the top six inches, you probably have hydrology in your soils as well. But basically there's 12 parameters for hydrology. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but there's things as, as maybe I am going into all of them. Let's see, oh yeah, like little things, crayfish burrows. Mm -hmm. So crayfish have to have oxygen. They live in the wet dirt, but they come up. So they build these little mounds, if you will. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies are sometimes a good indicator. If you mm -hmm. can find a lot of pods, they like to, um, usually they molt in the near wetlands. Uh, and then stain lines on trees. Basically, if you see anything ever mm -hmm. like this, this is how high the water's been at mm -hmm. some time. May have been after a hurricane, may not be like the normal seasonal how high the water gets, but it's a pretty good indicator. And cypress knees also are a great indicator. So if you are not, like some of the knees that grow up, do you guys know what cypress knees yes. are? Mm -hmm. So when they grow up this tall, the reason for those is they're trying to get oxygen. So mm -hmm. clearly there's inundation. Mm -hmm. But when you see kind of this stratus, these, these mm -hmm. roots like this, mm -hmm. usually our water has gotten up to the bulk of the tree. So this is also one of the parameters, it's called buttressing. So when trees swell at the base, not in a residential situation, because you can see that. I have a maple tree in my backyard that's like, oh, probably because of irrigation. But it's really weird, like it's got this, it's called buttressing when it's really fat at the bottom and then kind of comes up. So that's kind of what we're looking at. But I have clients call me all the time that say, I got this piece of property, there's, there's no wetlands on it. I didn't see a drop of water. Yeah, well, <laughs> you got a lot of pine trees. You, I can't see through them in a lot of aerials, but pine trees were planted, especially if they were planted, were planted in reed places for a reason, because they act like straws sucking up the water. Then you cut all those pine trees down, mm, here comes the water table, just like <clears throat> dropping a straw with your finger, uh, you know, drinking your straw. Mm. And that looks like a blank slide. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so what I typically do, a lot of times for everything we do environmental, we try to look at databases, which I'm hopefully gonna have enough time to talk about a little bit at the, on database and permit searches at the end. This is an infrared photograph where I have quickly, you know, clearly not, closed all the lines and there's a reason for that. But what I would do is typically look at all the databases, all the in-house resources I can find. Historic aerials are free from a site on, from the University of Florida. The St. John's River Water Management District still provides infrared photography on their website for free. Some of the counties, I live in Volusia County, they have one of the best property appraisers websites ever. Mm -hmm. They have every environmental aspect almost mm -hmm. that you could ever want in one place, instead of having to run all over the place. Orange County, not so much. But um, it's a lot of work. <coughs> so basically, this is an old, basically a lot of pine plantation and ag lands where we, we've gone out and kind of just tried to show you that typically when you look at infrared photography, anything purpley, it's usually wet. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't close this off, this line, because that is an unknown. So when we're going out in the field, we've kind of got stuff mapped out of what we think it's going to look like. But if we don't know, like, is this going to come around here? Or is this going to come back up here? Well, oh, no, can't tell from this. Um, but a lot of times under the pine trees, it's hard to tell. Because the pine trees are hot and the ground is cold, but you can't see through the hot to the cold. So mm -hmm. it just depends. But especially the deep, deep, dark spots, that's where you really got more of the standing water type stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of just a quick little lesson in wetlands. So one of the big things that we do, and I know it's blurry, it's hard to take your old plans and stick them on a PowerPoint, but basically what we start doing then in the development, or if in the plan development stage, so a lot of times people will come to me and say, well, there, even if there's wetlands, we're gonna wipe everything out. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. Because I will do everything I can to help you do that, but there are rules called avoidance and minimization, or and that's one agency, elimination and reduction. Both state and agencies mean the same thing, different agencies call them different things to make our lives hard. Um, but basically what we would do is we start laying out a development plan and we start defining what the impacts are. Another thing that we have to consider is if there's no development over here and you've got a wetland that continues off site, you're gonna be taking the hit for some of the wetlands off of your property. Because if you develop up to this line, your development is obviously going to have some impact on the rest of this wetland. You don't take a full 100% hit, but you do take a hit. 
So you have to mitigate for those areas as well. They're called secondary impacts. But this is basically what we would do. This was a huge site, so we had clearly we got to M N O of wetland number. Sometimes now we just do one, two, three, four. But this was a big site where we used letters first, and I believe we got into the like G G up to that amount. We started double lettering after that. But this is basically what we would be doing um, to show our impact areas in a permit. And I just wanted to show you that so you had an example, and then. What, what we also have to do, and we try to do this in the due diligence stage, we try to tell you how, about how many wetlands you have, and we like to, try, if you ask, we don't always put this in our reports because it's a more work, but if somebody asks, well, if I know I have wetlands, so how, you know, how much would the mitigation be? We wanna know all the development hurdles. We'll put that in the, pre, the preliminary due diligence report. So we'll try to estimate your wetlands, and, you know, got stuff you can't and we'll try to give you hints like avoid this one because it's high quality or this that and the other we go out when we're in the field and we try to think about all the things all the data that we can collect in the prelim because if you buy the land and I can save you money from going out there again mm -hmm. I'm probably gonna have to go out again because in due diligence we, due diligence we don't always flag the wetlands unless somebody really wants to know what are the limits I feel bad I'm standing right on top of you <laughs> and unfortunately, the, what she just mentioned is something that is really valuable on today's market, on 27 years, and I, 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 before I, I start working with Shannon, I use many other companies. Uh, not all of them understand that process as clearly and, and make your life easier by doing the correct thing at that point in time. And nothing worse than having to go back to a client and say, "Well, listen, this didn't came out on the phase on the on the phase one report, even though it should have." No, but not phase one. Preliminary <laughs> wetland report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Phase one's right. contamination. This is where yeah. most of the general population calls everything an environmental site assessment. <laughs> environmental site assessment is really contamination. Which is biological site assessment, ecological, environment, you know, that if you are being more ecology, biology, it's a good thing to try to separate what you're asking for because you will, you may get one thing and you really want another. So always clarify that because I do. When I get a call and somebody says, I need an ESA, I'm like, biological or contamination? You know, it's really important to ask that question because you don't want to. And the other thing of going there and, and look at things and say, well, we should, now that we are here, we should do this. That's really valuable. Right. But even we have a redevelopment project where the entire back of the property was wet. As soon as I pulled up the map, I'm like, the whole back of the property is wet. I didn't even have to go out there, I knew it was wet. So, how big? So, I estimate that. We kind of have a knowledge of what the mitigation cost is. I mean, the client didn't seem to bad and I moving forward, but. This mitigation is not cheap, it's very pricey. So it's important. However, to she was able to reduce, I, I'm still I trying to figure it, it out, but she was able to reduce the mitigation pretty much 50%. Yeah. From $100,000 to 53000 and, and what we did, and this is a sign of a really good consultant who's going to fight for you versus roll up. There are consultants that'll just, whatever the agency yeah. says, yeah, yeah. you know, there's people that just don't fight. But my job is to protect the client and to get them the best deal they can get. So uh, what we're doing is we're looking at, wetlands are valued on three basic parameters, their location. The site we're, we're working on now is surrounded by industrial on three sides. The score is really low for that. Um, water environment, basically what's going on, how high is the water table, Is it are the soils saturated appropriately, those kinds of things. And then community structures, really the diversity. What kind of species, uh, protect, you know, animal species can it house? What is the diversity of the trees? Are they different ages where they're, where it's not just like this old growth forest, it, you know, that it's got succession coming, that if a hurricane came and blew down all the big trees, you'd have little trees that would keep growing. That kind of thing goes into that. So we come up with this scoring system, um, which is called the uni uh, Uniform Mitigation Assessment Method. And we don't do this in the prelim, but I'm giving you the, Examples. We would do it generally in our heads. We wouldn't do all the numbers because that's part of the permitting process. But we have a good idea of this wetland's going to score, you know, low quality, moderate quality, high quality. And we can give you a range at that point in the prelim of what it's going to probably cost. Sometimes we're way off. We get out under the trees, like on this one site. Well, the wetland looked like it was all the way out to a ditch. Well, I maneuvered around the fence line because there was a little hill in there where some film had come on from the next lot. 
you know, and I did, it wasn't just a, you know, wrap around wetland. I kind of zigzagged through it. I really was digging pits, a lot of pits, to try to keep that wetland size as small as possible. And then we just re got a good deal on mitigation because the banker likes me. But I do a lot of business with him, so why wouldn't he like me? So um, that's what we kind of do. And then um, in the mitigation strategy, I'm going to run through the next couple things quick. But today, most people use what are called mitigation banks to satisfy their credits. There are many reasons for that. Number one, the Corps of Engineers, that's what they want. We used to always do, we, before banks came about, we. I had a lot more business because we had to create the mitigation ourselves. So to satisfy the rules, we use bank credits, but there's another reason we use bank credits as well. With the Water Management District, there is something called, in the regulations, the out provision. When you use a mitigation bank, it is determined to be what's called regionally significant. So if you have a regional, regional significance of mitigation, that means the value is higher than what you're impacting. You're getting more out of it because it's part of a large system. You don't have to meet avoidance and minimization for the district. The core, you always have to meet all those rules. So when you go in for a federal permit and you say you're impacting everything, you are, you're going to have a fight. And I have big, like I said, I have an industrial project now where they're going to wipe out everything. I don't know what my arguments are going to be. I am constantly going to bed like, what am I going to say? Okay, well, we've avoided the floodplain and we've avoided this ditch, but we're wiping it all out. And so it's going to be a fight because I have to prove how I, that I have to have, if I can't prove avoidance and minimization, I have to prove that this is my only economic option. And they don't care if you make 50% on your investment. If you make 10% on your investment, they're happy. And there's not a single developer in this world that's going to do a project for 10%. And that's another reason to understand why it's important to do these things ahead of time. Many of the clients do not want to hear that they don't want to hear it, no. answer. And, and unfortunately, in some cases, we don't have any other option. I mean, if, you, if she doesn't have happy. enough reasons to, to, to say and go back to bed, Worried about that is because there are not many reasons. That's right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I will, like I said, I will fight till the death. But I will also charge you $25,000 to do an economic analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I just avoid the wetland. <laughs> so in the old days, we used to do mitigation on-site or on off-site. Like if there was a property nearby, you could buy a property and actually do what's called active mitigation. You can still do this, uh, especially if you don't have any federally jurisdictional wetlands. But the reason people started going to the banking system and why it's been lucrative for people that started mitigation banks uh, is because with this comes risk. Risk of failure, the plant's dying. You also have to monitor and maintain these areas for five years, mm -hmm. minimum five years. Very expensive. So it gets expensive. I mean, wetland creation right now is about $55,000 an acre, maybe 60. Um, plus five years of monitoring and maintenance. So for monitoring, we have to go out there quarterly, document the success, send reports to the agency, well, the regulatory agency. Restoration is um, where you're basically restoring something that was wet. Wetland creation is also costly because you're use, you're losing usable uplands, right? Because you're making you're taking what's upland and you're making a wetland. But wetland restoration is a little easier. The problem is, is we argue about what is it worth with the agencies all the time. They don't think it's, it's already wet. We got jurisdiction over it. What are you doing to help it? And usually with restoration, what we're doing is taking out old culverts, removing ditch blocks, removing berms. You know, there is some construction involved. It's not usually as intense. Wetland enhancements really when you're going out maybe in thinning pines, if you have a wetland that's pine system or it's all not, not a cypress, you would never take out a cypress swamp, but if you've got like a dominated system or maybe it's dominated by um, exotic vegetation, bad plants, where you go out and you thin those out and you put, you know, put some other good stuff in. And then um, preservation, we used to do a ton of, that was really easy, you used to get credit for it. We don't get credit for it anymore. So nobody preserves, you know, even though you're not impacting it, you really don't get any, I mean, you get credit, but it is so tiny <laughs> that Okay, so you get a tenth of a, of a you know credit off of your mitigation price. They whoop to do, and we used to get credit for upland buffers. Any wetland that you are that you really are not impacting should have a 25 minimum 15 average 25 foot buffer around it, 
that just keeps people, think about homeowners in their backyards throwing their trimmings over the fence. Mm -hmm. So that gives it a buffer from it, future impacts and from lighting um, and from noise. I mean, animals and different things use these wetlands. They're dependent on these wetlands. So it gives you that buffer. If you're in the 25 foot buffer, remember how I showed you going off site? You're gonna take a hit, a quarter of a hit for going into the, uh, into the wetland, the adjacent wetland for mitigation. So blah, 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 I already talked about all this. That's kind of a design. These are some examples of successful ones that I've done in the past. Um, this was an area that was all pine, and we took out the pines and we put in willows, cypress, red maple, so it will actually be a nice uh, mixed forested wetland when we're done. And that was a the couple years later. That's mostly cypress. Most of the other trees, the water levels came up so high after a hurricane, so the cypress trees lived. Um, and that was fine, they, the, the agencies were okay. And we also actually got some natural recruitment of some wetland grasses. So that was, ended up not being exactly what we were targeting, but it worked. So like I said, wet, wetland restoration, these are just examples taking out old trail roads. So you've reconnected that wetland system instead of bisecting it. There's lots of little easy things to do. Um, that's the trail road that we took out that was in that picture. Um, and you can't really see it, but to be honest with you, there are little trees planted all through here. So um, basically, we just kind of flattened that out. You can see the tracks. We just kind of flattened out. A lot of times, people will build their roads up a little bit to get through those areas. So we scraped all the dirt out and, and replanted. Um, so this, like I said, this is on the PowerPoint. I gave this to Raphael so in um, PDF. So it He's got it if you guys want to get into more detail. Yeah, we'll detail. put it on the website so you can go back to it and review yeah. it and so on. So here's the big kicker of why in due diligence to think about the mitigation. Just look at the cost. So for one acre of, like, let's say one acre of an average wetland, you're going to be buying 0.7 credits. So you're at the low end at 70 grand. Our, our wetland that we just did ended up being... 56,000. Yeah, because it was really crappy. <laughs> it was a really low quality wetland, again, surrounded by industrial stuff. Junk had been thrown in it over the years. So it scored low, so it was cheap. But on a regular forested or a nice, decent, average system, you're talking about $70,000 at a minimum. If you're in Lake, the, and we go by watersheds, if you're over in Lake Jessup, <laughs> you can just start dishing out $325,000, boom, just like that. And this is yeah, pretty much the cost, soup to nuts in this area. Um, again, it's one out of pocket expense. It's expensive, but you pay for it, you're done. Now the mitigation bank is responsible for the success. So no five years of monitoring and maintenance, no worrying about you know, uh, managing a piece of property for your, the rest of your life or don't giving it to your HOA as a responsibility to do, which if you live in an HOA like I do, most of our buffers are full of vines and crap that nobody's ever taken care of. They just let it now, sit there. Now, 63% of the commercial uh, violations of brokers, commercial <laughs> violations of brokers over the last two years in, in Aura have been on a wetland. Wow. And what that means is that people came in looking for land, they went ahead and, and uh, the broker showed them some land that was uh, significantly wetland. They bought it without doing any uh, uh, yeah. research. research and end up being sued and uh, or eventually uh, found them guilty. Yeah, and the most recent project I had, which was an interesting one, the actual seller was doing, and they know they have, they know they have done wrong, and we'll get into some of the permit search stuff, but I had a gentleman that wants to buy a piece of property, he wants to build an office building, kind of, you know, a U-shaped office building, and the back areas will be bays. He owns a car repair shop, and I did another project for him long ago off of way down 50 on, on his first other car repair shop. And so he wants his car repair shop, you know, to kind of be in one of the back bays and really nice offices up front so that it's, you know, it's on a main road. So it looks really nice. He wants it to look high end like offices, but allow for both uses. But then in the back, he wanted, you know, 
the U-shaped building would then hide all the excess cars that he's got because he also buys wrecks and then rebuilds cars. So it would hide everything. Nobody would see it. You know, there's nobody around the other eight areas to see it. So I said, okay, well, what's the property address? And we're on the phone and I'm pulling the thing up and I'm like, um, is this, not, is this property got a really good price? And he said, yes. And I, he said, why? So there's a violation. I know there's a violation on this property. Something looks weird. <laughs> Let me look into it a little. And sometimes I can't see it, but this one was funky. So the homeowner, the owner, the guy that's selling it, has owned the property in generations of his family. But he threw so much crud in this historic wetland. The wetland used to kind of come out, and he basically filled it all up and made it really tiny. Well, he got in trouble. So I started going through the Orange County records. And while it never went to the Orange County Environmental Department, they know about it, it went through code enforcement. He fixed it with code enforcement, which is not fixed. It's fixed for code enforcement. It is not fixed for environmental. So he had us go out there and do auger pits, hand augers, not geotech, but do a soil evaluation for him to find the virgin soil that was covered up and figure out where this wetland limit really was and how far he could go and let that maybe scrape some stuff down and let it regenerate. <clears throat> well, day one, we go out there, we got the auger going, we're working really hard, you know, it's, it's great exercise for your waistline. <laughs> we're working really hard, we're going nowhere. So we go home, because we're like, how are we gonna, what is in here? What did he fill <clears throat> in here? We go and we get an auger, you know, like almost like a jackhammer. Mm -hmm. And we pull out so much crap, you got, we pulled out household trash from 1973. We pulled out concrete. We pulled out bricks. We pulled out tile. We pulled out tree stumps. I mean, I'm like, this is totally filled. I mean, it's so obvious. So we did him a little math, and it, it just, I mean, immediately. And he still, after I'm telling him this, without the report, if you want to stop, I'll only charge you for what we've done, and I won't write you the report. A pre app with the agencies, and like, you're really gonna. I'm thinking, I can't say this to him. I'm like, you're really gonna buy this property? Are you insane? And the seller had lost two other buyers, which I also could find a little bit about in emails on public record because he was selling it as is, but he wasn't gonna fix anything because he knows he has, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so, and, and now we have something that yeah. we didn't used to have. Now we have what 22 years of area photos on, on, on all of the websites. Well, I mean, you figure Google Earth goes yeah. back to '95, but so, the regulatory agencies, mm -hmm. the water management district, started regulations in '84. Yeah. So they can go, they go back farther. So that's where I talk about. And in these things. areas, going back into pictures is like insane. You would be. I mean, you can see everything. You can see happening. everything. Everything. So, anyways, um, I'm gonna kind of. We talked a lot about the eagles, but I'm gonna kind of run through the list. It's. Well, we got still got time. If you're gonna let me talk forever. How about hour? Okay. So basically, what triggers us to do the job for protected species? No matter what, if we're doing a report that's really called environmental due diligence report or even a preliminary biological assessment, or even a preliminary smaller wetland assessment, where we're just looking at wetlands, we're going to look generally for any protected species or any other hiccup, because we're going out there, we want you to know what the hurdles are going to be. So when we, what we do is we start with um, preliminary assessments in the office. Like I showed you with the wetlands, we do the same thing. We go through myriads of databases, trying to figure out what's potentially there. <laughs> um, there are certain maps that say this is the whole area where this bird could live in the state of Florida. Well, if you fall in that this whole area, <laughs> clearly we got to look for them. So we look at that, we look at all the maps, and we try to figure out what the habitat is. Now we use Google Earth and get on Street View and walk down the side of the road and go, okay, that looks like a maple. I think there's some oaks in there. We try to figure out what's going on. Um, we do have access um, some of it is public, some of it is not, to pre-recorded known sites. For instance, on the bald eagles, not the best database in the world, but the Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission, which is myfwc.com, if you actually go in and type FWC Nest Locator and type in an address of your project, 
You can see if there's a needle nest nearby. If it's known, that's the problem. They only fly the state every few years. And then it'll give you, you can even do it by radius, and it'll tell you how many eagles nest, how far they are, when they were last known to be active, if they're inactive. It gives you a lot of information. So there's a lot of pre-recorded known sites for things. <coughs> and Shannon, on habitats and so on, uh, for the New York guys, uh, usually they don't think about this because most of the businesses in Manhattan, Bronx, and Queens are already developed. But yeah, yeah. but but what happened with Staten Island, uh, where we do a lot of business? Uh, Staten Island still have a lot of uh, wildlife because of the conditions and mm -hmm. the amount of especially uh, the coastal wildlife and, and the coastal wildlife. So it, for the New York guys, it's important that we have that in mind. Yeah, and if you happen to get anything on the coast, let's say you get a guy that wants to build a hotel on Daytona Beach. You know, there's conditions that, you know, mm -hmm. then you start thinking about other species. Species I'm going to talk about today are really Central Florida centric. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of things to consider. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. If you're working on a marina, we got to think about whales sometimes, we got mm -hmm. manatees. It's, you know, some of them we still think about here if you're Lake Jessup, St. John's River kind of stuff. So I kept some of them in. But there's also, um, Reference guides, there's something called FNA, which is the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. And so they have different databases that they've been collecting on habitats and wildlife for years. And so they, you can run different reports like what species are known to be in what county. Now, if you're going to get a gigantic list, that doesn't mean they're on your site. Uh, it's also going to give you all the protected plants. So it's a big list, but you can also run what's called the bio biodiversity matrix and that'll tell you what the likelihood of occurring. So it'll only give you, it'll give, you can kind of draw a box in an area where you're looking and it'll give you like, likely to have a wood store, likely to have this. So you kind of have a good gist of what you're gonna be looking for in the field before you go. Um, and again, in the preliminary due diligence stage, our surveys are preliminary. So we're not giving you, unless it's a small site, 100% like, Oh, we found, you know, we covered 100% of the site and found four tortoise, gopher tortoises. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we're generalizing in this process. But if we see anything, we'll know. We can give, we can give you other information based on the size of the site. Uh, and then the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, they have a lot of republications on commercially exploited plants and the, and the protected plants in, in Florida. Uh, and then mostly we're looking for certain categories of species and they're different again state and federal different agencies cover different species um, but we're looking at threatened um, endangered and mm -hmm. in Florida we have species of special concern so pretty much this is what we do we kind of look at these are the things we're looking for and this why the other reason that we do these things is just being ethical I mean I, the industrial site that I'm talking about had Southeast uh, American kestrels, had a breeding pair. There are specific rules that have to be followed. It stinks when I gotta tell the client, I saw kestrels on your property. I tried not to see them, but they just kept flying by me. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to report it. I, you know, it's our job. And we have an obligation not only to our clients, but we do have to follow the law. I don't wanna go to jail for something <laughs> silly like a bird. Um, so we utilize our, there's different survey methodologies for different species, and that's why in due diligence we're doing generalized things. But we'll tell you, we'll come back and tell you, well, gopher tortoises have a, spur, you know, a certain way you survey. Kestrels have a completely different way you survey. Scrub jays, another type of bird, completely different. Crested caracaras, another bird, completely different. So sometimes we're surveying, we're trying to, you know, kind of do surveys concurrently. So if we can do... We've got gopher tortoises, but our scrub jay surveys are in the morning and the nighttime, then we'll do the gopher tortoise work in the middle of the day. So we're not traveling back and forth. But, so there's different ways we do things. Um, and then there's also the same kind of thing. There's avoidance via conservation. There's a lot of different techniques to get around the process. So we try to, in the report, tell you, hey, don't, get, don't go crazy. There are ways around this. But there are some species that are deal breakers. I am not going to lie to you. Eagles are expensive, but they're not a deal breaker. There are species that are deal breakers. So, like what? That is not a deal breaker either, but it's getting worse. Um, this is an interesting uh, species. Uh, it's a big black snake that's kind of purpley. 
and everybody mixes it up with the, the snake that's the, the, the black racer yeah. that's yeah. in your yeah. garden. Yeah. Everybody thinks yeah. indigo snakes are fat, much like the water moccasin, right. but they're almost a sh they have a sheeny purpley color, where moccasins are just black and nasty, and they're short and thick, and these are long and fat. So. Big difference. I agree. I wouldn't even stand around it. No one is. These <laughs> actually indigo snakes are the most docile snakes you will ever find. They are. They're so. I've been doing this over 25 years. I've seen two. That's why they're protected. Yeah. One was dead. Yeah. Got hit by a car. The other one I saw in about two seconds in Deltona. And the thing is, is these are supposed to be upland snakes. One I've seen, and most of the people I know have seen them near wetlands. So, and they're protected. They are highly protected, and almost every permit you get will say, "You've got to hang these posters. You've got to do contractor education. You have." Sometimes your permit will tell, will say, like for Sunrail, every day before Sunrail was in construction, we had to go and move sticks and branches around and walk the entire corridor they'd be working on that day to make sure there were no snakes in the way. Wow. Do you have an idea how much that cost? Wow. Just Welcome to Sunrail. Just to find it to move it. I'll never ride the Sunrail. Oh, it's again. not on the thing, no, is it? It's not a fine. It's, it's, it's what jail. you well, well, there is a fine, and there is jail time. What? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you intentionally <laughs> ignore... Well, this maker for us. Good <laughs> 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 <Good> one. <laughs> but most species do have... Um, fines that come with them. Uh, in Flo the Florida is not terrible if you consider five thousand dollars in thirty days in jail. Not terrible. That's where you start. That one's jail. No, this is federal. That's worse. Oh my God! Are Why? you kidding me? Why so protected? Because there's just not that many of them left. Yeah. I know. It's a snake. It's crazy. Trust me, I get it. All this snake in the world. I see a snake in the world. Yeah, you have got. There is in your permit package. There will be a strict rule. No worries. She's only seen twice. And she's active in the yeah. I mean, they're they're around. Um, the kicker on this and on this species, and the, there is a whole slide on this later. But the kicker about this species is there are different rules depending on where you are. If you're in North Florida, for the federal government's office, uh -huh. it's much easier. But if you fall under the, the Vero Beach office, not so much. So the rules used to be the same, but there's. There's more indigo snakes in North Florida there are, than there are in South Florida. Well, someone's done new research. Mm -hmm. Some scientist that sits behind a desk and does no, the the <laughs> has found out that the males and the females have much larger rain, roaming ranges. So now if you're impacting more than 24 acres of property and you fall, and the line is weird, it's part, like, Polk County falls under South Florida. Wow. You know, so it's a weird line, but it comes through Orange County quite a bit, uh, somewhat. So if you fall, if a project that's over 24 acres and has Full any size. type of habitat now, it used to just be upland, dry, scrub, habit, sand hill type habitat. Now if you have wetlands, adlands, anything, and if it's over 24 acres of impact, you're pretty much going through what they call as a key determination effect. Again, we're getting way outside of due diligence, but it's a big deal. Again, typically not a showstopper. It's a definitely a show slower downer when you come to permitting. Um, we talked about bald eagles. There they are. Yes. Right now, if you right now you could the babies all look like the baby on the left. They're dark. They don't turn white like an eagle until they're look like a falcon. Yeah, until they're quite a bit older. So it takes a while before they start looking. Um, that's the little southeastern American kestrel that I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're teeny weeny. Stick with it. There, there are, there is a breed that's just in Florida, and there is a breed that is down here during the spring. Mm -hmm. So right now is the time that you would see them. Mm -hmm. So we can't. Yeah, like one of, <laughs> no, does it protect it? Yes. That it's one is beautiful. beautiful. It has, this is in the falcon. It's the smallest bird in the falcon family. See, it's, be it's a little beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he's very beautiful. It's a little beautiful. But, but we can't do certain <laughs> surveys at certain times of the year because 
we have the spring people, spring groups down from up north. So how do you know if you're disrupting their environment? Well, how do you know if it's <laughs> from up north or if it's a Florida? Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> Let's awesome. just ask it. <laughs> So these, these coming from two months a year to do these surveys. So certain times of the year is best to do that type of business. Correct. Wow. Wood Floridian? Yeah. Wood storks are actually very, very huge birds. Ugly. They are so ugly. Yes. But basically there's maps of these. Actually, you can go and get these maps from the federal, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife website has a KMZ file you can put right on your Google Earth map. And it it's basically a it bunch of them? circles. It, it does show some of them if you get the whole database, but it shows circles of what's called their core foraging habitat. Oh, wow. So pretty much if there's a net a known colony, a there's like an 18 one. mile radius mm -hmm. around it. If you fall in project falls in that 18 mile radius and you have wetland impacts, you have potential impacts to wood storks. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. Again, some projects you have to mitigate larger housing developments. Yuri will bring um, all the apples. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch him for sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't be teaching you all this. Yeah. And then with, well, with Wellens comes in. He'll be like, there was nothing there. Yeah, we'll a ton of we'll other we'll birds. We'll yeah, a ton of other birds that you see all the time, except for you wouldn't see the burrowing owls, and these are really South Polk Osceola. You don't see them often here. Um, Lipkin actually came off the list. I didn't take the picture out because I already had the slide made. Um, but most of these birds, other than the roseate spoonbill, you probably see all the time. Yeah. But they have some level of protection. Very easy. They don't trip you up in permitting. We just have to note them. Okay. You know? And I need to emphasize that if you think that this is only book stuff, <laughs> <laughs> you are wrong. You are wrong. Okay. Yeah. We I see mean, it all the time. I mean. Yeah. What's the, the that is a red pocketed woodpecker. Oh, it looks very yeah. much like there's a woodpecker called a downy woodpecker that looks exactly the same. And unless you have binoculars, this one has a. When he squeaks, he sounds like a dog toy, but so do a lot of other birds. But it's a really high pitched dog toy. So there's different um, sounds that we listen for. But I haven't seen, these are in this area, but I have not. Where I have seen more of these probably is. What's that subdivision that's kind of out by Bithlo that, that was subdivided long ago? Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Wedgefield? Yeah, Wedgefield, Wedgefield, thank you. I could come up with field. Wedgefield. I couldn't think of the first part of the name. So there's some of those out there. There's some other protected squirrels out there. There's quite a bit protected of stuff. Protected squirrels? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What are the, which one's the, the costly ones? The big, big so this is a huge one right here. Florida scrub jay. Mm -hmm. They grow and in they a Florida scrub jay. Yes. So it's kind of like a blue jay, but it doesn't have the tuft on its head. Mm -hmm. They only live in scrub habitat, which is where we all want to build because you have less fill, stable soils, no wetlands, no issues. What are you except doing? for birds. <laughs> We're fighting for them. And tortoises. And skinks. So oh there's a few species God. that only live in these types of habitats. Del Deltona? Yeah. The land. I was going to say, I know I've seen them in Delta. Um, Orange, Orange City. Orange uh, City. And then you've got an entire ridge from um, oh. Blades, <laughs> Blades County all the way up into Pass Lake Florida. County. So there's a whole, I mean, there is a ridge in Florida, Florida Ridge. And I mean, it's just riddled with everything you could think of. So Lakeland, kind of up through the Polk County region. Tons of them. They're adorable, and they are very friendly. If you ever want to see one in real life, go to Lyonia Preserve in Deltona. They have a million of them. You're not supposed to do this, but if you put a cat on your shoulder, you probably have a cat on your shoulder and take a cat. They're very, I mean, they're very territorial. They're territorial, yes. And so for those those surveys, well, not only are the surveys extensive, it's a five, it's kind of a six-day survey. Day one, you set up base stations and calling areas, and then you have to do morning and evening surveys for five days. And then you have to chase them, which is hysterical. You, what do you, do? you should watch some of us in the field chase time. Them? We chase them because we, what we, so the what we have to do. Whoops, <laughs> going on land. So, so what happens, like so what you, we have when to you do have is, an area like that, do you like move them? It is, you sometimes can move them, 
But most of the time, you are going to set aside a large chunk of land. <laughs> and you are going to pay mitigation fees as well. What? So it wow. is, wow. I think the last, I, most people run away if they have scrub jays. I mean, they just are done. I mean, yeah. it is a two-year process. Wow. Again, this is a federally protected species, and the federal government has no time frames to do anything. Oh, so, where was we it? We found a nest on Orange City on a project, and it took, took us 29 months and $180,000 to solve. Yep, oh, 120. Wow. And I did a single family lot not too long ago that was a beautiful lot. But the scrub jay, there was also a nest. It wasn't an active nest, it was an old one. And I saw the picture in my phone. What about the nest is empty? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because it's still territory. So the birds kept, what we do is we, we map their flight patterns. Oh, man. We chase them. We try to count how many species are in the population. <coughs> We try to see if they're banded, if they've been banded in our... You can remove it if it's a banded? No, banded around its foot. Oh, and if it's already been moved, you ain't moving it again. So we have to take a lot of this data down. It goes into a very large report called the Habitat Conservation Plan. And this Habitat Conservation Plan, like I said, was a two-year deal. It takes a long time to put the data together. It takes a long time to come to consensus. We had that issue involved. Did that happen in Denmark? Edwin brought to me a... <laughs> and then he well, started calling me every other day. Are we ready to purchase? <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to purchase? Now now I don't understand why, why yeah. it takes what it takes. It takes a little while. Well, because you're telling me, I have more questions than that. <laughs> you know what? It, no, it no, no one's in, no, you did in the gym. Oh yet. my God. Uh, and the issue is that if you, if you get into one of these properties and make the investment, and then you figure out that you have this problem. You have to go through the next 24, no 28 is months to get it solved. You know how much is it going to cost? That you are not right. budgeting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. That's the crazy part. Because maybe a time frame, you're like, oh, okay, but you know, hundreds <laughs> yeah. of thousands of dollars know, on top of it. I mean, but even the time frame, your investors get squirrely. They could be making money off of something else. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. so, and, and, they, and the interesting thing is that we have to find out cases. For example, we did a property in 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 downtown Sanford several years ago, and I don't know how they found on a on a couple of bushes there two nests of the because where are they going? <laughs> we build on everything they live on. So even if like gopher tortoises, if we have a lot of species, but it's the habitat that's in danger because that's the yeah. property we want to buy yeah. because it has we think it has less hurdles but i can tell you and, and, and raffi will back me up on this we used you know in florida there used to be easy ways to buy land the type a good easy buildable land no more does not exist if you think it exists you're wrong we were at b and c before the boom the last time now we're in the c and d range i mean properties have hurdles it's just the way it is. And if you don't, you are lucky. If you find a property that doesn't, you're lucky. And, and unfortunately, when, when on our situation in, in Orange County, where land is so much limited right now, Usually, those tracts of land that you look at them and say, why nobody has built them? That's the yeah. reason why. Now that we know why there's yeah. big spaces. <laughs> yes, you do. And that is right. Wow. So this one would really only occur kind of more along the St. John's River, but the um, sort of, stuff. it's a sturgeon. And it actually, I know. Like it would be more of an know, issue yeah. if you were doing, like, um, let's say you were doing a housing development with boat docks yeah. on the St. John's River oh. or something like that. That's the only reason I left oh. it in, just so you know. It's not the only fish. There are more. But this one is so they start you. fishing oh, and they fish the fish. Oh, 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 we, yeah, we have a project in the Panhandle. Just for fish. It's a, trans, it's a bridge project. Let me tell you, I have people sitting out there. Counting fish. Oh Stop. my god! Stop. Counting, they count the fish. You just sit there and count them. Yeah, they sit there all day. Oh my god, that's a good yes, life. That's your tax dollars in your FDOT and your federal tax dollars. How do you know it's not the same fish again? <laughs> <laughs> I won. Don't be lying to me. She was there. Every day. Like, what? Is that the same fish? You're like, you're a bloody cow. You're the same fish. 
but it's, it's not that you're entering the construction area. We <laughs> start talking about one, two. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, we just <laughs> no, it's okay. It's getting late too. So this is a little girl. He lives in the burrows with gopher tortoises. So um, it's a gopher frog. So yes, we go all the way from fishes to frogs. <laughs> and tortoises, and this we do all, this is a staple of what we do. Tortoises, tortoises I've seen those all the time. are not a deal breaker. It's yeah, the land that's really thing. the problem and the development of the land and they're protected. That's why they're protected, because you're right. Gopher tortoises are everywhere. everywhere. But they're not cheap. So for every hole in the ground, every burrow, you can pretty much estimate, estimate spending about $2,000 to get through the process. Oh, wow. So if you have a site... You know, with 50 burrows, you're probably, I mean, with five burrows, whatever I'm saying. I'm getting tired, I can't do math. It can be closer to the yeah. 4,000. It can be. I mean, basically what you do is you go out, like in the preliminary, we try to give you an estimate of how many you have. We're not going to count them all if we're not getting paid to count them all. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have to do certain survey techniques. For those, we've got to walk surveys up and back, up and back, up and back. So you basically are walk. You have you know a string of biologists, and it depends how thick the vegetation is. If the vegetation is very thick, we might be this far apart walking through your property. I'm going to turn around and walk back. Keep doing this. This could take a long time, yeah. right? If it's thick. If it's open, we can spread out farther as long as we can see each other and see what's on the ground. It is a lot. The course surveys are a lot of work. It's hard work, especially. We in the have we are we are doing right now. You go to my board, you will see the two addresses mm -hmm. there. We are doing two projects on Christmas, on mm -hmm. Highway 50. Well, these are two long lots that we are developing from our shop. Well, at the very end of one of the lots, there is a pathway of 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 the coffers uh, <laughs> that goes. Through the property, through a corner of the property, you see that the tracks oh, yeah. are very, well, they, very they easy will to wear, They oh, will yeah. Yeah, wear a hole. So we don't, have, we don't have any actual tortoises Tortoises on the on the side, but they go it's through small. to get to their, it have been. So you're disrupting their way, their highway. Well, you're, <laughs> 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 the only responsibility that they have is to put up silk fencing yeah, around the property. So they still have, have their way to go Yeah, so on? they can go around the silk <laughs> fencing. Uh, Even though they dig, <laughs> they're not smart enough to dig <laughs> under and back up. They dig down. Uh -huh. They're dumb. Yeah. Well, the inspector came in, and what he said is, well, how how do you know that they are not here? Well, you so, survey, you know, I have to walk answer. the whole property with him, put woods and everything else, wow. so I can show him <laughs> that there is no... Oh, my God. God. I know. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, so we dig them up. Well, what we do is we do the survey. We'll go in and get a permit with different types of permit, depending on how many. We'll also, what we do is we dig them up, and we take them to what is called like, a, like the mitigation bank for tortoises. Mm -hmm. so it's called a recipient site. So it's specifically for tortoises. Scrub jays do have um, conservation banks as well. So sometimes you can just pay the credits there. Um, and one of the other fine critters, which is not the next one. So this was, again, the indigo. We got into that. But there's the one that has a little white chin in your backyard. Mm -hmm. He eats rats and mice. Mm -hmm. Don't get rid of him. He's important. He's very docile. He might look like he's going to bite you, but I have not put my finger in one's mouth and picked him up and take him out of my patio. They don't hurt at all. The little, the little guys. Not this, this one, right? This one does. These aren't. These don't usually bite. They don't ever hurt the open. It's non poisonous. Non poisonous, right? Sure. So again, this one's getting more difficult to permit now. Um, but I always tell people, not this one, because everybody thinks it's the wrong snake. There's also a pine snake, very also in Wedgefield. Quite a few of these, um, and they're also in um, Lake Mary. Um, Sanford, some of those areas that still have a lot of the old pine growth Rain areas. Rainhard, uh, Heathrow, all of that is yeah. very common. Um, again, this one's not a deal breaker. It's just, you know, another little hiccup in, to deal with uh, to follow a management plan. Again, St. John's River, I put this in here. Same thing, if you're going to do any kind of marina, I will have people out there watching. So <laughs> it is not, I, that's stuff I did early in my career. Sit out on the edge of a boat, on the on the barge, or on the edge of a dock, with your umbrella, because all you're doing is sitting like this. Are you? It's the most boring job in the world. Wow. But 
Now, may I teach you can tell the difference. So you do. They have scarring patterns. So you have to be anti. Yeah, you, you are trained to look for those little intricacies. So you don't count them again. But another showstopper. If you're in, during, if you're in the middle of construction, or let's say you're building a, a, a walkway to an island in the you know, maybe you built a pond, you know, uh, the city has a, a lake or something with an island in the middle, and they've made a park, and they want to come over, and it's all... If manatees could be there, mm -hmm. and they're building the stock, and building the pilings in, you have to do this. So you sit out there and you watch, and you can stop construction. You start bothering wow. the manatees, construction stops. Yes. Um, and there's a squirrel. That that? I picked one of the ugliest. Never seen that one. See that one. <laughs> there's quite Never a few of them, them in Wedgefield. There's quite a few of them in Ormond Beach. That they actually ugly. like... Um, they, okay. It says sand hills and pine flatlands, but quite honestly, they feed in oaks. So if you find like some old areas that have just never been developed, like large tracts of land still, almost every time, they'll almost always be there. They're hard to see, but they um, they strip cones. I mean, regular squirrels do this too, but they strip cones and they leave them at the base of their tree. Unlike other squirrels, like gray squirrels, just throw them everywhere wherever they're eating. They feed in the same tree, nest in the same tree. And they're really early. Most of the time I've seen them, it's been very early in the morning. Those things are smart. They they did a whole nest in the roof of, of the house that we used to live. And we called, and they came, and they covered all the holes. Damn thing. Yeah. Opened it. I saw it sitting there. I'm very surprised, surprised for all of these things. <laughs> and here's the other somewhat showstopper. Skinks. There's two types of skinks. Oh, Another species that we can only survey yeah, for at the beginning that up in the water? The year. No, Where is that in dry sand. In dry sand. Or in old orange groves, dry sand, high dry, that ridge area, so Lake County. So <laughs> what is it? What is it? Uh, it's a it's a it's a skink, so it's like a lizard. A lizard. A lizard. <laughs> but the interesting part about uh, the blue tailed mole skink is these are the tracks they leave. Um, but they live underground. So what we have to do to survey for those, we do pedest pedestrian surveys is the cheapest thing, just to kind of look, see uh -huh. if we see tracks, see if we see the right kind of soils, look at root density of grasses, if it's really thick. It has to be pretty open sandy, it, uh -huh. there's, you know, sandy patches, um, but we have to throw down <laughs> cover boards. So we cut out plywood, and we go out there and we put plywood down because they'll come up under the cool wood. And then we go out there every morning okay. and count them. Each four. Because they count, count them. Wow. And count them. And By the way, Larcona, Kowi, Apoca, Winter Garden, Papa. very common. Any, and here's an easy way to know if you might have this issue. Are you above 80 feet in elevation? So if you pull up a contour map, you know, your elevations like the uh, oh. United States Geological Survey map, mm -hmm. and you're over 80 feet, boom, you hit parameter one. Then you can pull up a soils map, and then you guys probably don't know how to do all this, but I can if you mm -hmm. need me. Um, you pull up a soils map if you're in high dry soils, boop, you hit fact number two. So you might as well send somebody out to look because if, there. if you've got the, if, sometimes in aerials, if I can see these open patchy areas, I know. Another, you know, Clement Sorrento Road, we've had to do surveys there. Definitely a pop gun. And I know very few uh, oranges. Uh, sites that have been converted into residential that we didn't have issues with those. No, and, and sometimes you don't, but I've had one in Polk, um, Polk County off of 27. Actually, two projects I've had that were old growth where we've had skinks in the areas that they used to keep maybe for staging or open areas. So they're not in the grove because a lot of times you're using chemicals. They don't do well with chemicals. They have porous skin. If you drop them in a chlorinated pool, they would die like a normal lizard. So they don't like chemicals. But if you've got a wetland edge that has, you know, like a 2,700 acre project, but I might have four acres around the lake that they didn't plant, mm -hmm. boom, four acres of skink habitat. <clears throat> Problematic. Guess what? You're not building houses in those areas unless you're spending, again, what's the magic number of pricing for eagles? $35,000 a credit to offset <laughs> skinks. Yes. So if you're talking about four acres of habitat, you're spending four times $35,000. I'm never going to look at these animals. Plus all the numbers. <laughs> Plus all the numbers. <laughs> all the numbers. I'm like, oh, there's 35. <laughs> 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 uh, 
It's kind of true a little it's bit. True, though. I mean, it is. Real. But then add consulting fees, so just go up to 5075. <laughs> Um, all right, so floodplains are pretty much the other kicker that your clients should be thinking about because floodplains. Flood so you know FEMA, like uh -huh. this. So FEMA, the Federal Emergency, uh -huh. mm -hmm. the Federal Emergency Management mm -hmm. Agency, mm -hmm. Agency, Agency. Agency, has their maps. This is what it looks like. I'm glad you guys all know this because this is important stuff to look at. You know, <laughs> you can look at all this. I mean, it's all online, and I give you and the website. This even applied to residential, by the way. Look, we're right here. Mm -hmm. I did it for this side. <laughs> so, anyway, right. Um, it does, you know, it applies to everything. So, luckily, we're high dry right now. Very low chance of flooding. Um, but it's really important to pull these maps because there's a few categories that can really trip you up. They also, there are also land development code issues. Some cities say you can't impact the floodplain at all. Some say you can impact it, but only for X, Y, and Z. Some of them say you can impact it, but if you build on it, you're going to not only provide, I'm not on that slide yet, but it's on the next slide, but you're going to have to use low impact development techniques, which are not terrible. They're sustainable practices, but you can add 35% to your development costs probably. Um, so it's really important to know, to make sure you look at this. And usually when I was with a straight environmental firm, we always did this. My engineers typically do this. <laughs> Engineers are pricey. So that's what it, the map would look like if you pulled it online. This is what it looks like if you actually make a firm map. So that's the flood insurance rate map. It's the same map, but this is actually what most of them look like for most of our lives. I like to bring this up to people because it gives you kind of, it, we use these a lot to look at all, when you're doing it on the website, when, the one I showed you before this, it gives you this little, you can zoom in and out. But when you pull these flood maps, a lot of times there's old connectivity, like little dot dash, so you can see where everything connects together. That also helps me with, is my wetland jurisdictional to the federal government or just the state? <laughs> so there's a lot of little tricks and trades where we overlap a lot of this data. And it also really spells out all the zones for you, which I typed up because you can never see them. You gotta zoom way into it. Mm -hmm. Which the other map kind of gives you these tidbits, but all of the, you know, the, the real gist of the, the heart of the matter is on your firm. And if you want to understand you just, how important this is, talk to anybody anything. from Houston or Dallas over the last year, okay. and they will tell you how important this is. Yeah. Because I have people right now that are seated on properties of 150 to $300,000, that they cannot sell because they have figured out last year mm -hmm. that they got four and a half foot of water on their wow. house. So, and there's other rules too when you're talking about, you know, your FEMA liability, if it's a recurring mm -hmm. incident. Mm -hmm. Like for me where I live, Flagler Beach, uh, you know, my hairdresser lives on Flagler Beach. She has flooded two years in a row. Mm -hmm. She's gotten FEMA money flood, you know, two yeah. years in a row. But she ain't going to get it forever. Oh, wow. So what ends up happening, and this is where it gets important to also keep thinking about the larger process, um, the long-term insurance costs to your client if you're building in a floodplain. Now there are ways to change that because we're going to put a bunch of fill on the property to raise it up. But then we've got money in the fill prices. We've got regular requirements to avoid the impacts in some instances or like I was talking about, utilization of different dis development techniques. Or, in the state level, when we go in for, um, when you go in to get your stormwater permit, if you don't have wetlands, you can get just a, a stormwater, master stormwater permit, still part of the environmental resource permitting process in Florida. There's compensatory storage. So, basically, you already have to build your pond for stormwater, right? So, when we're planning all that stuff, Planners will say low because they're trying to make you know their plans and get get, get all this development site. Mm -hmm. Really, I tell people try to use 18% of your site. It's going to go to stormwater. Well, if you've got floodplain, just try going up to 22, 25. Not only do you you can't flood other people, so you're building your <laughs> site up, right? It's illegal, so you're building your site up. So now you've filled floodplain. That water has to go somewhere. You have to account for it on your site. So for the most part, there are options. If you've got a nice contiguous drainage system where it can flow off site, if there's volume, you might have to prove that. Um, but typically what we do is we 
people build swales or they build a dry pond in addition, yeah. so you're losing developable land. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you avoid it, a lot of times there's some advantages because you can also use that for your open space requirement. If your city has a 35% open space requirement, stay. Design around the darn thing if you can. My industrial site has floodplain. That's the one little bit of wetlands I'm avoiding. And we're avoiding that. That's the only thing we're avoiding because it's such a pain to deal with. And it just loses so much volume on your site. Um, again, with redevelopment, if you're going to add on more building, like you buy a project and you want to add phase two and phase three, or you want to add a wing to a building, same thing. Are you going to meet your codes? Was it built so long ago that you're still in the floodplain? Now you might have to be, bring your new building up, then you're going to have a building like this and this. How do you account for these things? It's, there's a lot to think about. And then in places like Flagler Beach or <coughs> some of these downtown areas that are already developed, I will I think I'm allowed to say this, Altamont Springs is a good example. Yes. Um, Crane's Roost, the, the, those yep. lakes are stormwater ponds. Yep. So that was done by the developer. But closer to Sun Rail Station, there's no drainage. Mm. Everything was built so long ago, there's no stormwater ponds. There's nowhere to treat the water quality. It's just going through ditches and out through the lakes, which makes your lakes really yucky mm -hmm. and gives you water quality problems. So if you don't have existing infrastructure, mm -hmm. the cities may come in and build it for you, and then you're going to get a special assessment. So it's good. That's another thing. Knowing what's going on in your local governments is important because Flagler Beach is doing the same thing. I worked on that one, and I don't know what the assessments are going to be. That's still going through the economic analysis. But there will be stormwater assessments. So they'll get these assessments on their utility bills. And they're going to be paying higher fees for a, people are going to be paying higher fees for a long time. And in addition to that. And sometimes there's a one-time fee plus a, a bill fee. And, and in addition to that, you have the added cost of insurance, which we hear is going up 18%. Yeah. Because of all the claims. Uh, because of these features. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a couple of other things, even if you... Your property, somebody's property um, has own, owned property for a long time, and it's in the floodplain. There are special, there are special assessments that were given if you're grandfathered in. Now they started increasing the cost in 2013, but if somebody hasn't come up to the full rate cost on your firm map, and you purchase it, that cost automatically goes to the new price. There's no more, once you, tr it changes hands, there's no more sub surplus yeah, subsidy. So most of that we've covered since it's been going, they've changed that rule since 2013, thank heavens, because it was important. But um, that's a big deal. Now two other things that we do, and we can do for the client, is once you build the site up, there's things called a letter of map, uh, map revision, or a conditional letter of map revision on the FEMA map. No, I have. There was one, I think. I don't zoom, probably didn't zoom in close enough. But see these numbers here? Mm -hmm. These are numbers that people have revised the flood map because they, they may have been in the floodplain, but they've built up compensated. They don't want to pay the flood tax rates. It's a process. It's not a terribly expensive process. But you can amend your floodplain maps, um, to, you know, if you're, especially if you're in a big, big, serious issue. And one other thing is knowing your base flood elevations. If you guys, did they teach you this in real estate school? No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times there'll be an elevation listed. Like here, this lake says the elevation is 56 feet. So if this, if this lake gets to 56 feet, if it gets any higher, the flood is going to be bigger than what is shown. Right now at 56 feet, it's going to still flood the edges. So um, there's a lot, of, it's funny when I see 56, I live like at 10, you know, I live on the coast. So I see 56 and I'm like, wow, you guys are really high up. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another thing that I do want to mention, especially with these maps, and I know you know what FEMA is, but if you get in a floodway, woo, that's kind of another showstopper. Floodways are really protected, and I think it's on one of these slides and I like I said I haven't talked all the way through okay yeah so a lot of times in your flood way there is no encroachment allowed so now your property is worth zero and a lot of times it's along like the little econ uh, or St. John's wasn't the econ property for the church a, a flood way yeah so there are ways around it again 
This takes engineering, and it takes us at least a minimum of a six-month study. You have to prove that you're not in the floodway. Wow. <laughs> right. So, at least six months. You're basically modeling. You're doing a water mo shed model on this whole area to determine the potential for flooding if you think FEMA's got it wrong. It's not fun. Which they never are wrong. <laughs> they are. I mean, they'll, they'll, they've changed things, but for the most part, they know. I mean, you know if you're along a river or a waterway, you're pretty much going to probably be. Mm -hmm. if it, they're not all floodway, flowways, okay. but, they, but some of them are. <clears throat> so if you're in one of these areas, I did another project for, um, it was a Greek organization that had their little area where they met and had they had a lot of drinking is what they did <laughs> in that place. And um, they had a piece of property, a gorgeous piece of property near the intercoastal, but they had um, the headwaters of the Matanzas River that kind of came through their property. I mean, I could not get the city to budge. I'm like, we'll study it for six months. No, nope. we, nope, says floodway, you're doing nothing. We don't care if you study it for five years. We don't, <laughs> they were not budging. So you kind of have to know a lot of these things again, just to make sure and this was just one of the documents, just if you remember from the recent hurricanes of where all of our flood watches were going on. So just because Everywhere. you're not in a flood zone doesn't mean you won't flood. Mm -hmm. That's really important to know because if the stormwater systems back up and we get so much rain, I don't know how bad it was here because I was, mm -hmm. I, my house is actually <coughs> on the climate map, so I'll still be mm -hmm. here in 50 years, but I'm gonna live on an island. Mm -hmm. So when the sea levels rise. <laughs> So, anyways, just keep that in mind that anything is, I mean, Seminole County, how many areas so, of Seminole County are just terrible? Brevard, I well, for, for over six months, Lake Kiso doubled in size. Yeah. Hmm. On flood. Yeah. Flood. Wow. I mean, there's only so many places the water can go. So, and especially when we have a hurricane and some of these trees fall into some of these flowways, now you've got blockages, the water's not. How long does it take to, you know, culverts get blocked? This stuff can happen anywhere. There's a place in Orange City where they literally were putting pumps out. This is so this makes me laugh so hard because it's really funny for an, an environmental person. But they were trying to stop this flooding. Well, they basically were pumping. They were pumping it in a square, so the water kept moving. Oh they thought it was going to go down. They kept pumping it into the pond, and the next pump would pump it back around. And so it was just going in a circle. And like, so how much energy did we spend pumping water in a circle? Silly. Um, okay. Woo, getting late. Permit searches. I gave you St. John's because it's the easy one. Mm -hmm. But if you go to their website, very easy to find, and you go into their e-permitting up on the dash, you can do a search for any old applications without logging in. So you just click over here, and there's a lot of ways to search. But for you guys not knowing a lot about the permitting process, mm -hmm. what I would tell you to do is go into whoops go into the GIS permit search and then you can type in an address that's pretty much where we are right now I kind of kept trying to use our our site as an example so it shows you a number if you hit the identify little button like there are on everything and you click on this a little box will come up and it'll tell you how many permits have been issued you can either cut and paste or write down all these numbers mm -hmm. And then you can go back into your home shoe. This page will open separately. So you can go back to this page and you can put your permit number in here. Or if you don't know that and you don't do the GIS search, you can enter as much data as you know about the property. Like this is the project name. Like if it's built and the housing development is called, I don't know, Shannon Pines, mm -hmm. then you can type in Shannon Pines. However, I will warn you that that's not always a great process because I have a project that was called Sift Oaks on its permit, but today it's called Canopy Oaks. <laughs> so you would never find it searching by project name. Contractors, county, so, and then date range, but on the date range when you're searching, I would always leave it as no date range, date range so you can get as many hits as possible. Yeah. Sometimes it's too many. And once you type in the permit number, it will take you through all the correspondence a lot of good information environmentally is in what's called the technical staff report, TSR we call them. It gives you a lot more detail, so it'll talk about what species, what they found out in the field, how they dealt with the rules. So if you can 
do this little search and know that there was a permit because a lot of times some of this raw land, especially back before the recession, was permitted. These, and some of these subdivisions may have sections that they were permitted, but they've expired. So sometimes you can find out what your wetland acreage was. Might not be exactly the same today. You can, if you, maybe you have an active permit and have entitlements. So it's always right. important in and the due diligence case, that we look for that. In our case, I don't expect you to do this no. and, re and remember this. No. I have a short procedure that I follow to get to that and give it to you. And at certain mm -hmm. point, I talk to her and she take it over and we do some level usually, of consultation. Usually most people pay me to read all this stuff. It is boring. You know, not everything I do is fun watching yeah, and, birds, and you have to understand what you're reading in order to right. react to it more. Right. right. And plus, if you miss something, you know, like like I said, yeah, if like, you see yeah. that number and you just write down that number and you don't click on it, and there's six other permits that may have a different number that are also associated with that same block of land, which this one does have, by the way. It has a different permit number under that layer. So somebody did something else, retrofitting or a new stormwater pond or stormwater pond. Yeah, when they did the overpass on... There you on, go. On Redbox, they re redid the, uh, the retention pond. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's why there's a different permit. So there's number. about three or four permits. There are the several. Yeah, I was surprised. Because the first one was just one, but I think the second modification had five <coughs> permits with it, which means it might have been little changes. But So you can get a lot of, usually there's a lot more junk than this little one. This seems to be an easy project. That's why there's only three little categories. But everything that's public, I mean, application is public information, so everything will be there. DEP regulates different projects, so single family houses and different things like that. They have a pro uh, same kind of portal, it's called Oculus. It's not as easy to use, I'm not gonna lie to you. I have to send my team, my young people to training for Oculus, it's not, it's not user friendly. It's not terrible when you look at it, it's the same kind of parameters. But there's so many searches, you can search for asbestos, you can search for storage tanks, there's a, some of it I won't give you um, as a just a regular public um, login. You have to have special logins to get detailed information on some things. You have to be an environmental professional because they don't want you to go find this contamination and throw it on somebody else's property to, you know, for spite. But it has a lot of information there. So if your DP does, it's interesting because they're basically the same type of agency. They just permit different types of projects. So most commercial, multifamily goes to the water management district, but single family and more marinas and those kinds of things go through DEP. And then Orange okay. County has also, it's, I'm giving you the environmental one, but if you just back up a couple of spaces on the sidebar, you can fast track permits in Orange County. And I do this as well because I want to know, was it ever permitted? Now environmental is, Low on the uptake. These are, you know, all this freedom of information right on the web is is hard for cities and counties that have limited resources. So they put things on as they can. So like our project with with Eddie, Eddie's not that's not on there. Yeah. And we did that in 2005. They've just never scanned it. But from now, you know, once they started this system, they, everything yeah, new else. is on here. And they've gone tried to go back and scan. Now the other project we have on Thorpe. The documents from 1984 are scanned for construction, so stuff was known yeah. then. So this Orange County is good. You still look consistent. No, you have to. You have to sometimes still drive down to the office and pull records. Mm. If you can't find stuff, I'll spoil well on the property record. A lot of times you can see what's been permitted. And on most a site. of most of the sites <laughs> that have been uh, county pushed, like for example the retention pond areas on on. Uh, Gordon Rug, mm -hmm. those ones are in, right. but then permits that are next to them are not. So yeah, it's it hit or miss. Mm -hmm. so, but but if, if it is in there, there's some good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I gave Seminole County since we're sitting in Seminole, they have no permit search. Uh, right. Most cities and counties don't. Oh. Orange County's rare. Most of them allow you to apply for permits online, but that's mm -hmm. the search. So mm -hmm. um, so to search it, you have to go to the county. Yeah, you actually have to go and go through the plat books and blah, that's really? not such a fun job. 
Uh, even in, for example, in cases like Seminole mm -hmm. County, you need to know who to ask yeah, the questions. That's true. And that should be a second. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's the hard part. You get shoveled around the system for a month before you ever get to the right person. So, All right, so that was a lot of information yeah. really fast. Some yeah. of it more in-depth than prelims, but I wanted you guys to be aware of all the hiccups because <laughs> even though we were talking about due diligence, you should know about the hiccups. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that you have get the gist of what we are talking mm -hmm. about. Obviously, we don't we don't need you to know everything the way she knows it. Right. Uh, that's what, that's what she's here yeah, for. That's, that's, that's what we go for. to. Her. But right. but but what what is important is mm -hmm. to understand that decisions like the one that we are talking about in Kissimmee and the one that we are talking about in 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 mm -hmm. Palm Bay uh, <laughs> required Patience some. Patience and, and, and some yeah. level of of, of research and understanding to be sure that we don't get into problems. But if you lose twenty five hundred dollars on a phase one because you don't move forward, it's you're better than you, losing, it's losing better three or four hundred thousand. I know. And mm -hmm. same thing like with me going out and doing mythology. So we don't you know, be calling kind of everybody. I'm going to stop calling you. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I also have yeah. some shameless plugs because I would be remiss. My company makes me put this as the last slide. Oh, nice. oh, nice. They make though. they make us. Our templates have strict instructions. Wow, very don't put this media picture media. and don't put this picture. If you use the slide with this, you may not use a picture. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. We have graphic designers in the company. Nice. So and again, for the sake of our group, uh, yeah. run the questions through me, and I'll, if I cannot answer it, then I'll, I'll send it to her. And, and, and please understand, I will do everything I can to give you as much free advice as I can. But I am running a business. Yes. Yes. So, of course. Yes. You know, the old client clients have been with me a long time probably get more preferential yeah. treatment. Ah, probably a little faster. Take advantage of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially when they said, I need you to do this. I know, I'm I just like, okay. okay. <laughs> I don't but, know but, on the other side, but on the other side, I simply <laughs> refuse to use other people. <laughs> When she moved to BHB, I moved my class to her. Yeah, which is unusual. And, Most and, people aren't that loyal anymore. And 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 I'll do it because I because you saw the quality yeah, of what we are yeah. talking about. So yeah, and you see how much that's in this head. Yes, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. You know, this many times. So some stuff I do have to look back over. I'm you know I'm not a computer. Yeah, I have to use twenty five years of experience. Oh, there so is. Yeah. So. Okay, so guys. Uh, Thank I you. think that, that she, yeah. she, she deserves a good hand. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you'd all be asleep by now. No, it was very interesting. No, it was not so high tech. I'm very scared. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, that's the point. I mean, you should be a little worried for your clients and for everybody else. Because now, if you're not, then you're not doing them your 100% service. And it's your yeah, reputation it's too in the future. For the sake of the next class, yes. two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. Two weeks, yeah. Two weeks from now. So we, we go back to the regular schedule. Uh, we are going to be dealing with. Uh, we're going to, to stop the regular training to, to start dealing with the farming. Yes, we haven't forgotten. The only people that have sent me possible farming areas have been. Uh, no, have been. Mimi. Uh, Mimi and, and Liza. Oh, good for that. So, Liza. Liza, of, really? And then Mimi uh, and, 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 and her husband already sent it in. So, send me your areas. Remember that I need time to check on that, and I want oh, to be really? sure that you want to write it. I was thinking of mine on my way here. Oh, 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 you're talking about ag areas? Uh, is that what you're talking about? Well, in, in a well let me just tell you one other thing, because this was also some of the development people, just since you guys are focused on that. Uh, I'll just call them out. Consolidated Tomoko over in uh, Fuji oh, County owns oh, a lot of the land. So what they did was convert a lot of lands to uh, silviculture, which is trees, or sod. Well, in agricultural land, environmentally, keep in mind, they may have covered other stuff um, mm. historically. And if you change, or even if they covered wetlands, when you change land use from agriculture to anything else, they gotta research the whole thing. The agencies can go back and take what was originally there because agriculture has some exemptions to allow you to impact those things. But you change the land use, 
you go back to old wetland limits. No, I might, might all, it's all built. Money. You gotta make money. But anyway, <laughs> so send me the money information so we can start to work on that so we will have... We yes, will go through. Th we will run through examples of each one of you, mm -hmm. so we get real. We won't spring break. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Well, by the way, you look good today with that shirt. Thank you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like you're gonna go dance salsa or something. <laughs>